So we're going to have both semifinal matches today, and we will have the grand finals tomorrow. And if you guys don't know, my name is John, also known as Zero Skater 12. And joining me here is Tristan, also known as Twister Strudel. How you doing today, Tristan? Good morning. It's great to be here. Always up for some unmatched games. I'm excited to see these two go head to head. Oh, for sure. And then also a fellow John, also known as Tommy Elliott. How you doing, John? I'm doing great. Super excited to be here. Talk about this match. Rematch of the century could be. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks for joining me, guys. And thank you, everybody, for watching here. Uh, also, big thanks to Restoration Games for sponsoring this event and for the guys at Warple Board who are always really helpful and supportive of everything we're doing here and to all the players who participated and showed interest in the event. It was just a great time. So uh, really excited to get into the finals here. And um, so we have, yeah, Joshua Tan versus Baked Goods for this first semifinal. So, uh, John, you had mentioned this is a rematch of the century, right? Yeah, this this is a rematch for both of them. So Josh is undefeated in this tournament, but for one game. And and that match, that game is against Baked Goods. Uh, in round four, Baked Goods beat him and beat him hard. It was a 0-2 loss for Joshua. Ooh. So I'm sure that Josh is looking to, to come back and, you know, Get reclaim his, a little victory here. Revenge, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, until that match... Josh was not just undefeated match-wise, he was undefeated game-wise, too. He won 2-0, 2-0, 2-0, lost 0-2 to Baked Goods, and perhaps that defeat got in his head a little bit, because since then, he has not had a match where he was undefeated. Ooh, yeah, the mental blow might have got to him, but here he's, a little he's bit. back for vengeance. Absolutely. <laughs> Definitely going to be exciting to see. Uh, do you guys have a favorite here? <laughs> Who do you think is going to take it? Both of these uh, uh, players are extremely good. They're well known in the community. Uh, they're both two powerhouses, so it could be anyone's game. I I don't have any favorites uh, in regards to who I think could pull out in this match. Sure. How about you, John? Well, I truly think it's a toss up and unmatched anybody can beat anybody. I think if you just looked at the statistics, it is favored baked goods. The only match that he's lost this tournament is the one he lost because he knew that he was going to get into the top eight. So he picked, you know, legendary, terrible fighter Spike <laughs> just to have a little bit of fun. <laughs> sure. Because, it, it, you know, it no longer mattered whether he won that match or not. He was going to the final. So on paper, baked goods, you know, looks better. But as we both know, that doesn't really mean anything. And it, this can go anyway, and Joshua's track record is extremely strong. Plus, he does have that desire to come back and get his revenge. And that That's could be true. fueling him in a way that is not fueling baked. That is true. And uh, just a, a fun fact here is uh, Joshua is also one of my fellow TOs. Um, he helped organize the tournament with me. So, uh, And we also have Baked Goods, who is a fellow YouTuber. <laughs> so. Um, I'm pretty close with both of them, so I really don't know who's going to win myself either. I think it could definitely go either way, and we're just going to have to wait and find out. But uh, while they're getting set up for the game, uh, anybody who's watching who is unfamiliar with how Unmatched works, uh, we have a little bit video to show you guys just to give you a quick rundown of, you know, what the game is, how it works, what's the, what's the point of playing. So we'll go ahead and show you guys that while we set up for the game. Unmatched is a card-based tactical fighting game featuring various characters from history, literature, and fantasy. The goal? Reduce the opposing hero's health to zero. Players take turns performing any combination of two actions from maneuvering, scheming, or attacking. A maneuver causes the player to draw a card from their deck and lets them move any of their fighters around the board. They may increase the distance of their move by discarding a card known as a boost. When a scheme card is played, simply follow the text on the card to complete the action. For an attack, the turn player will choose a card from their hand to place face down for combat. The opponent will have the option to place one of their cards down as defense. The value on the cards will determine the damage dealt in combat. Melee fighters can only attack adjacent spaces, while ranged fighters can also attack any space within their color-coordinated zone. Some characters have sidekicks to help them out, and others fight solo. Each hero has their own unique abilities and deck of cards to bring the character to life. Because in battle, 
There are no equals. All right, so there you have it, guys. That's how the game works. Basically, uh, you're going to choose your fighter. You're going to duke it out. So um, I think we're just waiting on the fighter picks. The way this format worked, we played what's called Conquest Format, which is um, you pick three fighters. So you take turns alternating your fighter picks till you each have three. And then both players get a ban of one of their opponent's fighters that they don't want to play against. And then you're left with each two fighters. Then you're going to play, uh, you have to get a win with both of your fighters to win the match. So it's a best of three match. And if you win with a fighter, you cannot use that fighter again. So again, you have to get a win with both of them. And um, so there's a lot of strategy that goes into what we call the pick and ban phase of the match. And if you do a really poor pick ban, you can have a severe disadvantage throughout the match. So it's very important and it, it's almost a game within the game. And so once we get those picks in, we will go ahead and convey those to you guys and we'll, we'll chat about the picks and see if we can make some predictions. Okay, and there we have it. So uh, mm -hmm. we have Baked Goods with Sherlock, Beowulf, and Ingen, also known as Muldoon. We have Joshua with Bigfoot, Robin Hood, and Medusa. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like Joshua has two thirds of what we call the big three, which is Sherlock, Medusa, and Bigfoot, because they're just extremely powerful. Um, mm -hmm. So it looks like he's going to get to use one of them in this match. But do you guys have any predictions on the bands? Well, it's interesting just to see these picks because already right off the bat, they're not what I'd anticipated. For a start, mm -hmm. there's no Dracula on the field, despite the fact that Joshua picks him quite often, has the best win rate. Um, of any of his fighters is with jo uh, Dracula. But I do know that Baked Goods picked Sherlock, stole him out from Joshua. Joshua picks Sherlock 80% of the time. So definitely some strategy going on there with that pick. If I were Joshua, I would ban Sherlock. Sure. Alternatively, because he knows Sherlock so intimately, it might be really fun of him to ban Injin and play Sherlock. What a show we would all get if he were to take Sherlock on and take him down. Okay, yeah, interesting strategy that would be. Tristan, what do you think on the ban? What's your prediction I, there? I totally agree. I, I feel like Joshua is someone who knows Sherlock. He He's someone who, uh, like you said, has picked him numerous times. And, and I would love to see a, a little bit of a different uh, ban here with that in-gen pick, um, especially, let's say, going into uh, something like a, a Bigfoot. You know, if, if let's say, Big Goods bands of uh, Medusa instead we know that uh, Ingen does really well into Bigfoot and Beowulf with some of his you know that rage mechanic and being able to uh, use a little bit to to um, be attacked defensively as well with those Grendels and, and, yeah. and there there's a lot of potential for uh, Bigfoot to be uh, to be played here so I'm almost expecting Bigfoot with the Medusa ban and I would yeah. love to see uh, Joshua with that in-gen ban as well. I 100% yeah. agree, yeah. I, it's got to be Medusa ban from Baked Goods' end. Because uh, he obviously, I think, picked in-gen to target Bigfoot because um, in-gen has had a winning rep record overall, I think, against Bigfoot throughout the tournament. He's kind of been discovered as a counter to one of the big three, so he's been very popular. And a lot of other winning uh, matchups as well. But So yeah, you got to think Medusa's banned from uh, Josh and... I don't know, like you guys said, maybe we'll see an in-gen ban to switch things up, but uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah. Well, I think it'd be a really good mind game because, it, like you said, it's clear that in-gen is picked as the you know anti-Bigfoot choice. And it's possible that Beowulf was chosen with that in mind, too. So if you got rid of in-gen and you kept Sherlock, meanwhile, Baked Goods is banning Medusa. Okay. No. Well, here we go. <laughs> so that's a pretty standard um, ban yep. you'll, that you'll yep. see throughout the tournament is Medusa and Sherlock. Just because Bigfoot is part of the big three still, but he's fallen a little bit in popularity just purely because of Muldoon almost uh, being a potential counter. So people, uh, it's, uh, it's almost like hot potato, like, oh, who's going to get stuck with Bigfoot and then get countered? So. Yep. Yeah. All right, and then we've got to just see, we'll see who they're going to play in game one because game one is a blind pick. So Baked Goods knows Joshua's options and vice versa, but they don't know which one they're going to play. So they have to both decide uh, and put one of their cards face down 
and then they're going to reveal at the same time. So that it, you know, you might not get the favorable matchup. Maybe Joshua's probably hoping to get Bigfoot into Beowulf. Baked Goods is hoping to get Muldoon into Bigfoot. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Right. One of the very interesting points that I would like to uh, make here is, is Baked Goods choices. If you look at his track record throughout the tournament, Baked Goods has been able to play as a variety of characters. And these two characters are are not ones that he has played as yet. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, so that's going to be uh, play a huge part. We have not seen Baked Goods uh, uh, pull out either of these characters. And even looking at some of the stats over over the course of this tournament, he's picked, I think, like 12 or 13 different characters over his entire span. So this will add another two to the roster. Wow. That's impressive. Being able to play with a variety of characters definitely gives you an advantage when it comes to this pick ban phase like we talked about. But another point that we were talking about earlier, guys, is that uh, we call Baked Goods the thief because throughout the tournament, he, mm. he kept picking his opponent's favorite fighters and using them against them. So instead of having to waste his ban on the opponent's strong fighter, he would just take them instead. And then he still has his ban for other fighters, which is a very smart strategy if you're able to play this wide range of characters like he can. So it's interesting to see in this case I know Joshua, we play a lot, and Joshua doesn't really play either uh, Muldoon or Bigfoot. So we're not really seeing the thief in action here. So it's a he, he switched it up for this one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, Josh gravitates more towards Sherlock, Dracula, Robin Hood, and I've seen in a pinch he'll go with Little Red. But mm. the last time he played Baked Goods, he lost with Little Red twice. So I can understand avoiding that again. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it's very interesting, like you said, Tommy, uh, with the with the lack of a Dracula ban. I mean, we can see Baked Goods sort of stealing that Sherlock pick from uh, Joshua as well. But with that lack of a Dracula pick, it's very, very interesting to, to see how that all played out because we know Joshua has been known to take Drac and how Baked Goods has often, even in that previous matchup, he had stolen Dracula yep. from Joshua during that that. Uh, that play so uh, it's it's very intriguing seeing these fighters being pulled out and another point to make uh bouncing off of that tristan is that perhaps baked goods picked beowulf early and if he did beowulf is a big counter to dracula so maybe joshua didn't feel comfortable picking dracula into a pre-established beowulf hmm. Good right point yep absolutely that that leader follower dynamic that that is seen in the Conquest format does allow for a little bit. And it, it would seem as though Baked Goods had the, the leader. I guess it, from from the screen, it seems that he had the leader picking that Sherlock first, and then you know Joshua picking one of the big three, and then that Beowulf uh, pick. As you said, that could play a huge role in, in this whole phase. Right, right. And again, leader and follower for anybody unfamiliar, like we said, you pick, th you take turns picking three fighters for the Conquest format, but uh, um, the, f the leader is the one who picks first, and the follower is picking second. So the follower gets the advantage of knowing all three fighters in full before they make their final pick, so they're able to counterpick the leader. But the leader gets, of course, first choice of fighters, so often they can get you know the most powerful fighters first before their opponent has a chance to take them so it's really a toss-up uh, to say which one is better than the other but it's just an interesting dynamic so yeah and the stats carry out that there might not be a huge swing advantageously between one or the other between leader and follower yeah sure it's, yeah. it's relatively close to 50 50 in the in the win rates so it right. looks like we do have the matchup set up for game one and it's going to be baked goods beowulf versus Joshua's Robin Hood. So I don't okay. think that's the one that either of them were necessarily looking for, uh, but th this will be interesting. I think this is probably the closest to a 50-50 matchup that we could have gotten in uh, this lineup. So let's go ahead and take a look at Beowulf's deck to start. All right, so here we have Beowulf. He is actually one of the newest fighters for Unmatched. He was actually released back in uh, 
well, a pre-release at the end of last year, but early in January of this year. So it's been quite some time since a new set has been released. But Beowulf, his key cards is the Ancient Heirloom is a huge hitting attack, which cannot be canceled. And canceling is something that just negates card effects. So it blanks the card effects, and only you care about the printed stat number. Now, every, well, I shouldn't say every, but most decks have what's called Faint, which is three copies of a card that cancels all effects on the opponent's card. But with Heirloom, it can't be canceled, so it can buff itself to huge values and hit over a Faint no problem. And Equal of Grendel is a card to bounce back recoil damage, basically, onto the attacker. So that's what you mentioned, Tristan, where Grendel can, or Beowulf can do damage on defense and not just offense. And then Fatal Struggle is a key card because, especially in this matchup, what it does is if you win the combat, so if you deal damage to the opponent in your attack, you're going to draw two cards. And then if you lose the combat, your opponent draws two. But in this case, Robin Hood only has a max value defense of three, so Fatal Struggle is always going to win and draw you two cards unless the opponent feints it and cancels the effect. And then War King is another versatile card, so it can be played on attack or defense. That's what the purple cards mean. And you can spend Beowulf's Rage, which is a mechanic he has that every time he takes damage, he gains Rage, and he can spend that Rage to do uh, bonus effects on his cards. And so the War King can buff up to huge values for attack or defense. And Golden Drinking Horn also uses Rage, and you get a variety of different effects to choose from. For each Rage you spend, you can choose another effect, which includes moving, healing health, and drawing cards. So. Those are a lot of really powerful cards, and everything with Beowulf basically revolves around his rage mechanic. So that's going to be very important in managing the rage. And then let's take a look at Robin Hood's deck as well. So for Robin Hood, he's a very aggressive fighter. He has a lot of attack cards, and his ability lets him jump back two spaces after an attack. So he can, he can move in, hit for an attack, and jump back out of range to safety. And the Hunter's Eye, that's just that big value 5 right there. Then we have Wily Fighting, which is a great card because it's going to deal additional damage to each um, opposing fighter that's adjacent to the fighter who uses that. So it can be used as attack or defense and deal extra damage. Ambush is a great attack that randomly discards a card out of your opponent's hand. And oftentimes a good ambush can make or break the game if it hits the right card. And then it also buffs Ambush's attack value with the boost value of the card you discard. And then Highway Robbery is for Robin Hood's Outlaws, which he has four of, and all of his Outlaws only have one health. But there's four of them, and they can recur with that card Defenders of Sherwood. And Highway Robbery, it cancels all effects and ignores the value of your opponent's card. So it completely negates their card and will deal the two damage through to the fighter unless Highway Robbery is fainted, so feints are going to be key in stopping those cards in this matchup. And yeah, then... Highway Robbery uh, is going to be a really big deal in this matchup because Beowulf only has 12 cards to defend with. Knowing when to play a defense card and when not to um, against Highway Robbery could be the make or break in this game. I definitely agree. And especially seeing as if you do decide to defend and it is a highway robbery, your card is canceled. That's one of 12 gone for no gone. effect. Yeah, yeah which is that, huge. and that that's going to hurt every time. Yeah, definitely. unless, of course, it is a feint, right? Because those feints do, are the only thing that will negate that damage. Yep, that's true. Feints are going to yep. be key for sure. Yep. And let's take yeah, a look I, at... Oh, go ahead, Tristan. No, I, I was just going to say, I agree wholeheartedly with that idea that feints are going to be absolutely a key factor to this game. I think on both sides, they they both have, will uh, kind of play a little bit of those mind games a bit. Uh, Beowulf with that ancient heirloom, Robin Hood with those highway robberies, and even the Hunter's Eye, because fainting that is, is very disadvantaged, uh, disadvantaged to the opponent. Yes. Uh, and, and so those feints are going to be key. I think this game is also going to be a huge positioning game, too. Um, you know, will Robin Hood be able to, you know, stay away from Beowulf's big swings? Will Beowulf be able to move in and get some big attacks? That's going to be a major factor in this game. Yes, I definitely yeah, agree with that. Absolutely. I think Robin Hood has more opportunities than most to play some mind games with Equal of Grendel, too, just because he has a lot of attacks and many of them are very low in terms of attack value. 
Um, mm. uh, granted, there there is Hunter's Eye, there is Disarming Shot for those big fives and fours, but he has a lot of attack, so he has uh, many opportunities early in mid game to try and, you know, um, like tussle those out. Yep, the mind games are going to be huge in this matchup. Yeah, and let's take a look at the map that they chose. So it looks like they are going to Sherwood mm. Forest. And it appears uh, Robin Hood is going first. So I got to think that Joshua got, he was follower. And so he got to choose this map and starting position. Because I think as Beowulf, you would never want to put yourself in that position where you can get attacked turn one and potentially have no defense. So if you look at the zones on this map too, it's... Um, there's a lot of different zones, but there's a lot of interlapping between the zones. And Robin Hood can move and then hit from range and then jump back with his ability back to safety, especially with all these corridor-like paths where he can use his outlaws to block. He can attack Beowulf and then use his ability to jump behind the outlaw back to safety where Beowulf can't reach him being a melee fighter. This is a really good map for Joshua if he picked it. Which, again, I, I'm with you. I assume that he did. I'm also not surprised to see Sherwood. Uh, fun fact, it is the third most picked map in the tournament so far. Really? So, Yeah, so I'm, I'm not super surprised to see it. Um, it's a really good map for him. It's Sherwood. We've got the Sherwood guys coming onto Sherwood <laughs> Forest. So Definitely. I think we're in for a good, a good time. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Absolutely. I think this, this pick is... is going to be really nice for Robin Hood. Uh, another very uh, underrated but yet still valid point here is uh, with with Beowulf's partner uh, using that remnants of Valor with Wiglock. Uh, if you have a, a map that is very interconnected that allows you to hit two or three outlaws at a time, that's that uh, means there's less people to, uh, to guard Robin Hood, that there's less outlaws out on the field. And so having a corridor like map in in this game where you know if he can get a remnant of valor it only hits one outlaw if he can position that really well i think that's going to do wonders as well yeah i agree with that it's it's harder to it's harder to hit more than one outlaw when it's all these corridors mm -hmm. so i think a good map choice by joshua absolutely all right and the players are just setting up now and we will be getting into the game shortly uh, if I had to make a prediction on this this map here in this matchup, I, I think the I'd have to give the edge to Robin Hood. But Beowulf has a lot of health and he's got a lot of quality defenses, although not a lot of quantity of them. They're very good. And if he can call out the right times to take undefended attacks and gain rage efficiently, I think Beowulf definitely has a chance. So I think I would go with Robin Hood, but it, it's going to be a close one. I think the map choice gives Robin an advantage that he otherwise might not have had, because there are things working against him. There's uh, the high health on Beowulf plus the healing, and then there's the fact that Robin starts so low, has such low defense, has no healing, and Beowulf has big, uncancelable swings to wear that down. But I think that posi yeah, positioning is going to be key here. Um, like Tristan said, the corridors are huge, because if he positions those outlaws right, Beowulf is not getting to him. Yep, definitely agree that positioning is going to make or break this game. Absolutely. Like, I, map, I, I feel like map choice and, and that whole positioning game is a very, uh, uh, it, it's not talked about enough in Unmatched, just how important that is, that is with, the, with the games. And so, um, yeah, this is going to, I feel like this is going to favor Robin Hood, as you guys have stated, uh, but it's going to come down to those, uh, those mind games, you know, with, can Beowulf manage to take some of those undefended hits with the with the highway robberies? Uh, will will Joshua be able to use utilize Robin Hood and and play off of those mind games a little bit to maybe get uh, something like an undefended Wily fighting? Uh, be able to to kind of evade some of those uh, use a hunter's eye without that Grendel. That's going to be another interesting interaction. It's going to be very interesting to kind of. Uh, look at how things pan out in this match. Yep. 
All right. I think the threat of Grendel is going to be greater than, than Grendel, Grendel itself, itself in this one. Yeah, yeah, I think I would agree. It, that's always the thing. It Just it being there, just it is existing, I think is enough to uh, change the outcome of the game. Yeah. yeah. So it well, looks like, like they said, are pretty much set up here. So go ahead, Tristan, yeah. but we'll get into like the game in a said, second. Like you said, Robin Hood is is at a very low health. Like he doesn't have a whole lot of health to start out. So you have that 13. If you can get a good Grendel in with a a high attack, that is a that is a large chunk of health that is being dealt that he he can't mitigate, right? right and so right. that that is going to be huge. All right, looks like we are in the game. They are about to start. A new thing we did introduce in this tournament specifically was a mulligan, which means both players draw their starting hand of five cards, and then they get to choose whether or not they want to shuffle their entire hand back in the deck and draw a new hand of five, or keep the hand that they got originally. And so that gives you a chance to maybe smooth out your hand a little more. Like in Beowulf's case here, if he doesn't draw defense in hand, he has a chance to mulligan, and draw a new hand that might be better suited for that second starting position there. Right. It, it's, it does allow for a little bit of, of different strategies to form as far as, you know, how do you want to start? And it gives you a bit of the that freedom where if you don't happen to shoot or to, to pick up a very great hand to, to reshuffle the deck and, and potentially come out stronger. Right. So based, on, based on positioning, what do you want to see? right now if you're Joshua in your hand? I think you want to start off with a big attack because maybe one of those hunter's eyes because Beowulf only starts with one rage as you can see these tokens up above Baked Goods camera there. So mm -hmm. Grendel to activate the recoil damage effect he has to have two rage and spend that two rage in order to do that effect. So with him only starting at one, I think you want to hit hard right off the bat if possible. Right. Yeah. We we are seeing Baked Goods keeping his hands. So either he ha he must have some sort of good defense to potentially uh, uh, defend against such a strong attack that Robin Hood may have. Uh, so that that is very interesting to see that play out to to see the the keep from baked goods and the mulligan from Joshua as well. Just uh, maybe he's looking for uh, a couple of um, more stronger attacks. Uh, either way, this looks to be an explosive match, and I, I I'm looking forward to how this plays out. Definitely. And here we see baked goods trying to decide where to start his sidekick. Because if he wants to start Wigloff, which is the sidekick, up in this green and pink space, he can block the outlaw from reaching Beowulf turn one, which, as you mentioned, Tristan, he could potentially move the outlaw up and go for a wily fighting right off the bat. And if Beowulf doesn't defend, that's four damage that goes through. And here we're seeing that exact move. So I think the mind games start right off the bat here. Yep. I'm very interested to see uh, Wiglock being placed on that bottom part of the map. Maybe that's uh, to allow for a little bit of extra mobility to, to you know, be able to reach, kind of uh, ambush them from the, the backside to put, put some pressure. Uh, I'm very curious as to how that plays out, but it looks like we're seeing an attack happening right away here. Yeah, and I did hear Joshua say that it was from the outlaw. So here the mind games begin. Does Baked Goods defend in risk a highway robbery? Or does he let it go through and it could be a Wily fighting for four or even an ambush and knock a card out of hand and potentially even more damage? Ambush would be uh, awful if he pulls a defense, any defense. Big time, especially because War King is a three value boost. So it would bump the ambush up to a five. Yep. And many, right. many of his other cards, even if it doesn't end up being uh, oh. a defense. Oh, wow. <laughs> that We're was huge. The okay. Mind games <laughs> right away. That's Turn a big one. win regroup for attack. Baked Goods. He chose to take just a simple regroup, which is that one value attack. So only one damage. That's the most efficient rage you can get. Yeah, that is a huge win for Baked Goods. One damage, only, only a... Uh, you know, he gets one rage, but the other thing is Robin Hood has excessive card draw, and to make him draw two cards right off the bat is going to be huge for him uh, late game. 
as these matches tend to go, now that we're at, you know, this the quarterfinals, these are some very talented players. These do tend to go to end game. And having Robin draw two cards right away off of a regroup and not even necessarily one of those cards that has him draw two or three cards, it's it's a big I win. Forgot about my <laughs> Absolutely. No, what a what a great read by Baked Goods there with the with not playing that defense. I once again it, it's it's already starting. Those mind games are 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 starting here. And Baked Goods, he he knows exactly uh, what what Robin Hood can do with if you can if he can get in your head. And so uh, what a great read. Yeah, although one thing to think about is if Joshua was trying to bait a defense, I think he should have attacked maybe with Robin Hood instead because then Bale might have thought it was a bigger attack because there is no risk of highway robbery if it's Robin Hood attacking. So maybe he should have attacked with Robin Hood instead, but it's hard to that's say. A, I mean, that's a fair point because to something you said earlier, a really big opening move for Robin right now would be Hunter's Eye because there's no threat of Grendel at, you know, at first move. And so if you attack with Robin, I'm sure Baked Goods is thinking it would be Hunter's Eye to take advantage. Right. <laughs> but to start off with two Rage already and only having taken one damage, that's a pretty good start for Baked Goods. Though it did, the regroup did give Joshua two cards to draw, but that would have been the same situation if he just chose to double maneuver. Mm -hmm. So we're also seeing Baked Goods playing a little bit more defensively. He's he's wanting Joshua to come to him. Uh, there was a little bit of an opening if he had chosen to boost and play aggressive, maybe take out a bit of health from Robin Hood right off the bat, but he's, he's playing a little bit safer, wanting Josh to come to him. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's it's very intriguing to play out because Robin Hood now, if, if he wants to attack with him, he has to move right on up oh, to oh, either okay. Bigfoot or Wiglaw. Here comes another outlaw attack. These are the big moments right here. Yeah. Oh, and we are seeing the defense. Interesting. Oh, wow. So we do see a Grendel in a highway robbery. Uh, so an interesting ooh. thing here. I'm going to, yeah. you know, this needs to be told right off the bat is defender resolves first. <laughs> As we all know, that's a big thing in Unmatched. So these are both immediate effects. So Grendel will resolve first because it's on defense. And he did choose to spend the rage, which will kill the outlaw who was attacking. But the highway robbery still goes through and then cancels the value of Beowulf's Grendel. So the two damage also goes through to, big, uh, to Beowulf. So it's kind of a clash right there. Mm. Interesting very interesting. Play. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a very well, interesting interaction right there for, sh for sure. Yeah, because no matter what that card was, the intent was from Baked Goods to kill that outlaw with Grendel. Right. Because the outlaws only have one health, so Grendel would kill it guaranteed. Right. And I do think he yep. does. He has to kill off those outlaws as soon as he can, so he can get in and land those big attacks. If Absolutely. he can get Robin's health low enough, early enough, it might scare Robin off a bit and make him play a little more safe and cautious. Which I think is what Baked Goods wants, because he doesn't want to take a constant aggression. Right. The other thing to note is the the use of the rage because you know he has only so much rage uh um you know being able to use it back and forth i uh, i know a lot of people including uh myself like i i've tended to hold on to that rage and the danger with that is uh then you're not utilizing all of the abilities so with baked goods just being able to utilize all that rage and obviously with this vigor and courage being able to give him a little bit more that's going to be huge Yes, so Vigor and Courage, the scheme played, his opponent, Joshua, has to discard a random card, and then Rage is gained equal to the boost value. So he ended up discarding a Snark, which is not what Baked Goods wants to see, because no. the boost value on Snark there in the little circle on the right side and towards the middle of the card, that is only a 1. So he only gained 1 Rage, which if he would have gained 2 or more, he would have been at max Rage of 3. But 
sadly, he only got the one. And Snark is also not the most impactful card, so not a great hit there. Yep. The thing with Snark is uh, not only that, he it also means that Joshua doesn't need to draw that card. He it, yeah. you know, that pulls him into the game further. The, the good thing about this is that that's one less defense for Robin Hood. True. That that is that is a really nice thing to to have in regards to that. But uh, yeah, that Snark being pulled out wasn't uh, what Baked Goods wanted to see. At least not the optimal thing here. Right. And then we see here Robin Hood boosting with Steal from the Rich, which again, boosting means during your maneuver, you discard a card from your hand. And in this case, Steal from the Rich has a three boost value. So it adds three to your max movement for that maneuver. So he could, Joshua could have moved all his fighters up to five spaces, but it looks like he only chose to move Robin Hood himself. Or yeah, maybe, he, maybe, maybe he's he trying to- Yawas, I didn't see. Maybe he's trying to tease out another Grendel because this would be a really fun time to attack with regroup again. <laughs> that is true. Grendel is live with the two rage. So Joshua always has to be careful of those Grendels and it's there's the mind games of back and forth, you know, yep. is it going to be Grendel? Is it going to be a big attack? And both players have to make a good call. Well, he did boost to get to him, right? So if I mean, that's the mind game right there. I boosted to get to you. I'm attacking you with Robin who has high attacks. I know you have to rage what are you going to do about it big goods <laughs> right calling him out <laughs> and and even with the with the draw like he, big goods may not even have that oh. grendel but oh there it is but he we he see the grendel and it's on a against a two attack not what big goods wanted to see that was a great bait no. by joshua because not only is it going to uh force baked goods into a situation where he either wastes the grendel effect on only two damage and then is stuck with zero rage or he doesn't even use the effect at all and there's two out of three Grendels gone yeah. during this game. And Joshua then gets to draw two cards. Looks like he is hand. gonna use it. Mm -hmm. I would agree with using it because I think you just need to lower Robin's health at any opportunity you can get because you might not get a lot of opportunities. I would agree. Yep. And, you know, honestly, having him draw those two cards, there's already a pretty sizable difference in their deck count. Yeah, if you look here, Beowulf has 22 out of 30 left in deck. Robin Hood only has 18 out of 30. So that's a four-card difference. And I guess we should mention the significance of that. During competitive unmatched, it tends to go to the end of the decks, if not close. So what we call fatigue or exhaustion is once you run out of cards in deck, every time you're supposed to draw a card, whether it be by a maneuver or a card effect, you take two damage to all of your fighters. And so you die very quickly after it gets to that point. And so four cards difference in deck count is basically four times two damage each. That's eight damage difference if it goes to fatigue. So yeah, we're seeing we're seeing baked goods playing once again defensively. Uh, he has an opportunity to to swing at Robin Hood, but I, I whether he doesn't have the defenses or he's just wanting to play it a little bit safer. Because uh, if he had moved forward, uh, assuming he didn't have a skirmish to move him out, Robin Hood could double attack with the with that positioning with mm -hmm. where he's at. So that that it's a very interesting uh, move for for baked goods here. Not only would he get double attacked by Robin Hood because Robin has a ton of cards in hand, but Robin would also use his ability to bounce back out of uh, out of range of Beowulf into this yellow space that's in between the two outlaws. Because he could attack with the first one, bounce two down to that bottom blue space, attack him again from range, and bounce two into that open yellow space between the outlaws to safety. This was right. a good move because, you know, for those who don't know who are watching, you can only have a maximum of seven cards in hand at the end of your turn. So he's forcing Joshua, who's going to start with seven cards in hand. Either he'll have to maneuver twice, which is super not ideal. You'll have to throw away two cards, or he's going to have to boost to get to him and still have to give up a card in order to get to, to attack. Yes, but it looks like if he wants to save his cards in hand, he can just move up and attack Wigloft instead. But Baked Goods is putting that, um, that choice on Joshua, whether or not he wants to boost and get to Beowulf himself or just, you know, take the opportunity to hit Wigloff. Okay. And he is going to boost. Very now, move all up to five. Now, Steel from the Rich is, an, uh, is often used 
by Robin Hood to boost his maneuvers. Uh, it, obviously with the scheme allowing him to draw not just one, but potentially two cards, putting him uh, closer to exhaustion. Uh, it, it's a very niche card where, where it doesn't get, the ability doesn't get used incredibly often. So you'll see a lot of boosting with those Steal from the Riches. Uh, he does have one left in his entire deck, but uh, from, uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing him utilizing some of that and attacking Beowulf right away with that outlaw. Oh, mm, here's the mind game. Mm. So there's the feint we were talking about. So it cancels the Robin Hood's card, but this, he was looking, I'm sure, to cancel a highway robbery. But instead, Joshua attacks with the Snark, which is going to be three over the two value of the feint, so it still deals a damage. And you don't really care that Snark gets canceled because all it was is a card draw, which at this point, Robin Hood doesn't necessarily even want. Yeah, it would have been better for Baked Goods if that card draw had gone through, I think. Yep. Yeah, so far up to this point, we're seeing Joshua playing extremely well, get, getting, leaning fully into those mind games. Yes. And this is another interesting position, Tristan, because if he, Baked Goods wants to double maneuver, he overdraws. But if he wants to move in and attack the outlaw here, he's in the yellow zone that Robin Hood is also sitting in, ready to double attack. Right. So very, yeah. very interesting position. I think if I was Baked Goods, the ideal move here, if possible, would be to move Beowulf up a space into this green. So he puts Joshua into a boost position yet again. And then he could play another of those Vigor and Courage schemes to maybe fill up his rage. But it looks like we are going to see Baked Goods taking an aggressive path here, and he's going to boost with re that Remnant of Valor that you had mentioned earlier, Tristan. Right. Which that could, uh, I don't know, that could be a useful card later in the matchup, so I'm a little worried to see that gone right away, yet there is another copy. Yeah, I'm I'm especially interested to see it get used because Robin Hood doesn't seem like he cares to attack Wiglaf, so there is definitely a possibility oh. of using that later. Oh, 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 oh. We see it right away. It is. So it got that's him in to kill off an outlaw good. and hit Robin as well because it deals a damage to each adjacent fighter. Yep. Not a bad yeah, play. Those, yep. Both those remnants uh, of Valor's being used right away. And, and another thing to note with those schemes, it, uh, using schemes that either don't give your fighter an action or, or draw a card is what a lot of people would consider a pass where uh, it it means they don't have to worry about getting closer to exhaustion with their actions. And so having having that one pass is, it, it's small, but it still can change the game in, in a major way. That's a great point. Passes are very important in this game when it comes to fatigue scenarios. And Robin Hood doesn't have any passes because the only schemes he has draw cards. And here we see a huge oh, swing in the game. Yeah, the wow. Oh, wow. That is a big, big win for oh. Big Goods, I think. That was a huge win, because now that puts Joshua four cards down towards okay. Fatigue because he dealt four damage to Wiglaf because he didn't defend, and so draws four cards. And now Wiglaf is a beefy sidekick. He starts with nine, so he still has five health. John, what do you make of attacking with uh, Disarming Shot into Wiglaf? Because I think the move is not to defend him. Joshua had to have anticipated that. I would agree. And now we're in a scenario, though, that this is probably a hunter's eye, which if Baked Goods doesn't defend again, Wiglaf will die. And I think he does need Wiglaf in the long run so he can kind of flank Joshua and get to him in more ways than just one with Beowulf. But uh, yeah, I don't know. That disarming shot was really risky, I think. Yeah, it's those sidekicks are going to be huge in this game and, and for Wiglot, even just having him on the board as as a way to help bake goods a little bit with the positioning game and to, to be able to defend against Beowulf and everything you know I, I think we'll, we'll be seeing a big attack here from Joshua trying to take out one of those big defenses and and, uh, there, we and there we go yep, yep. so well call yeah I think so that, uh, that was smart by baked goods though keep Wiglot alive so he, then go ahead you know retroactively thinking of the strategy there joshua must have thought that through and thought yeah i will draw four cards i'll have to go further in deck but it would be worth it to one shot 
Wigloff. That must have been his his mode of thinking. What do you make of that? I think I don't know. I still feel like it's too risky of a play. And now we're sitting here with Wigloff still alive, Beowulf at a healthy 13, and a five card difference in the decks with Beowulf still having what maybe four passes i believe he has two golden drinking horns and two more mm -hmm. remnant of valors yes or not correct. remnant of valor but vigor and courage yeah so right, yeah i think beowulf is definitely going to be looking towards a, a fatigue win condition here at this point Absolutely. I th yeah i think i agree that was a really risky strategy um and it didn't it didn't pay off yeah Robin Hood is going to have to play offensively here. And and we do see that he discarded that steal from the rich because he had more than seven cards in hand, which is an all right card to, to discard. Uh, it does mean he won't be able to boost. But the, the one thing I would say that uh, Joshua does have with this map in particular is that it, the zones themselves are very connected. He can still be able to to um, you know get to a zone and, and be able to take one or two shots so it, it, it can work for him to play a little bit aggressively here uh but he has to be careful because even in this situation he's gonna have to boost if he wants to attack beowulf uh again and interesting we do see a boost with a feint hmm. so maybe joshua is worried that uh the ancient heirloom that threat of that card hitting over the feint without being able to be cancelled is great enough that he's not going to want to use feint as a defense the other thing to think about with the feint at this point, he's not necessarily wanting Beowulf to like the the other major part that he could feint is that fatal struggle. And, and considering he is much lower with his card draw uh, or or with the cards that he has in his pile, he if you're thinking in terms of exhaustion, he would want Beowulf to potentially draw extra cards up and just hope to defend with a higher defense card, let's say like a Wily Fighting or another Snark. Unless I misunderstood, it looked like Joshua accidentally revealed his card before <laughs> Baked got to play a defense. Yeah, I think I caught that too. That could be a big yeah. slip up. Because it is the highway robbery, so that's what you want, is you want to just take those undefended against the highway robbery. Mm -hmm. And then he gets rage from that as well. Yep, so two damage only and a rage is a pretty good exchange. You don't really get one damage to one rage conversions really often. Oh, I hope he marks it. Hope he marks what? That I, th I think uh, he should be at two rage now. Was he at one before the attack? Yes. Yes. He was, so he should be at two rage now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and rage is a mandatory effect, so it's not like, oh, he forgot, you know, let's just let it go. So it will automatically trigger the rage. Yep, and th and that rage is key. It's a it's a major part in this matchup. You know, being able to get off some of those effects definitely is. And One. I think oh, it's it's easy to make little mistakes in such a high pressure situation like this. Your mind is thinking about so many different things that little things like that are easy to forget. Absolutely. Mm hmm. This is the quarterfinals. These are two highly skilled players. They're really being serious about this. And one thing that I've absolutely loved and I've noticed is the amount of laughing and back and forth camaraderie you've seen between the two players. Yeah, yep. semifinals, just to be clear. But, oh, my bad. But yeah, I, I agree. And it's because these guys know each other. They play, they've played against each other for fun multiple times and chatted on Discord and everything. So they're very familiar with each other. So it's... It is cool to see that kind of camaraderie in such a high pressure scenario. So here we see Baked Goods throwing out a golden drinking horn after his maneuver, and he only spends one rage to heal to health. So that's what we call a pass yet again, because he didn't draw with this effect. 
And not only did he get to pass an action and not draw a card from his deck, but he also healed the two health. So that's a big swing when it comes to fatigue. Here we Ooh. see another faint discard. For We're seeing wow. another faint for a boost. I was very curious because, yeah, once again, Robin Hood wasn't in attacking range to Beowulf or any of the outlaws. Uh, I, I was curious as to whether we see that one outlaw going for Wiglock just to kind of avoid, you know, wasting any cards, but we're, we're seeing that boost here into effect. More mind this games. Outlaw attack. Is this the faint? No. He does have the faint. Oh, and this time it is the Wily fighting. Mm. So he's still going to take one damage, but he gains that one rage, so good conversion. And also Wily yep. fighting, if w left undefended, would have dealt three damage from the combat and one damage from its after combat effect. Yeah, yep, that was that was a, a good defense. Uh, even though it was like you weren't able to get that faint off on the highway robberies, where those are the only cards that can defend against it, this is a great card as well to to defend against with uh, that extra damage being dealt to Beowulf. Definitely was a great defense there. And again, playing to fatigue, you gotta just try to preserve your health total the best you can. Once again, this this positioning, baked goods is is showing off us a masterclass of of the positioning that he's doing with Wiglof and and Beowulf and um, you know if Joshua wants to be able to uh, attack Beowulf, he's got he's not going to be able to double attack. He's just going to have to uh, move in and and be able to get those hits in, and that's that's huge. Not only that, but he baked goods keeps putting Joshua in a position where he has to boost. So you're, he's running out of cards to boost with. We've seen two feints discarded as boost already. We've seen all the steel from the riches go. So there's not, you know, he's running out. And eventually, he's not going to have anything left to boost with. Yeah, and that's, that's another major play, putting Wigloff into that red zone. And, and again, forcing him to, to move in with Robin Hood close quarters. Yep. Or just take the, you know, concession and attack Wigloff, which it looks like is what he's choosing to do. And I think at this point, Joshua can't afford to double maneuver anymore because he's getting so low on deck count. So he doesn't have the time to play kind of passively like that. So if Baked Goods keeps putting Joshua in the situation where he has to keep discarding cards to boost into range, it, he, Joshua's gonna run out of cards fast. I wonder if Wiglaf defends here. There's one. There's only one left. faint left, right? Are there two? There's one faint left from Big Goods. One, yep. And Tristan, yep. do you know how many robberies are left for Joshua? Looking at this now, there are two highway robberies, two. I believe, two if I've left. counted correctly. Right. Okay. And so, then there are. You have to imagine Josh really still has two regroups. One of those has to come out as a bait, a bait attack. Wow. So. Whoa. There goes the last feint, but a good call wow. by Baked Goods, keeping right, Wiglaf alive over that Wily fighting that would have dealt the four damage. All right, one of these ambers. Wow. That is nuts. My turn. But now Baked Goods doesn't have any feints, and Joshua knows that any highway robberies will guarantee two damage. Not only that, but his ambushes, he still has two ambush, I believe, in deck, and both of those are going to get their effects, which could be game-changing, hitting a potential defense out of Beowulf, or even one of his passes at this point. Yeah, surprised we haven't seen the ambushes yet, but perhaps he was just waiting for those feints to disappear. Right. Did Baked Goods take a, a rage off of this last uh, attack here? That was onto Wigloff, so he won't gain rage. Oh, right, the w Wigloff one here. I think Baked Goods is in a relatively good position overall, but I think that his lack of feints now is really going to potentially change things in the next few turns. I think even a well-timed Defenders of Sherwood could, could really change it up. And, and for those who don't know, that's a defense Robin can play to bring back an outlaw. Yep, that was the blue card that we showed in the key card highlight there. 
And he, it's, since it's a blue card, it's a defense, it can only be played when Baked Goods attacks Joshua. But he can use it on a defense for an outlaw or Robin Hood. So as soon as Baked Goods goes in for an attack, you've got to expect the defenders of Sherwood is coming out. And that could mean some trouble. Yeah, both of these characters are starting to run uh, a little bit lower on, on the defense as we have six defense from Beowulf, only two that can be used for Wiglock with those skirmishes if he if he so chooses. Uh, and then seven from Robin Hood. And again, all of his characters, those outlaws and Robin Hood can use those defenses as as he wishes. So uh, it's going to be very interesting how, how this plays out. Now yeah, no longer a huge disparity between defense left between the two fighters. Yeah, so a thing to think about when talking Listen about before. fatigue <laughs> is that an attack is yeah. essentially a pass if your attack uh -huh. card doesn't uh -huh. draw you cards because that's an action you're taking that isn't drawing a card in, out of your deck. So because Joshua has been able to keep up these aggressive attacks, it's helping him out in the oh, deck count. One. And here, of course, There's we Sherwood. see the defenders of Sherwood. Nice. So Rob, but this does make draw, Robin draw a card, pushing him closer to fatigue. Mm -hmm. So that could be a Absolutely. little risky. And we see a, and, an epic yeah. poem from Beowulf. That's the first one we've seen of this, which gains him a rage, and then it gains one value for each rage. So that bumps to a five, and he did deal two damage over Robin Hood. Epic poem, great play there. He gets some damage off. He gets full rage. He loses no rage. Really well done. So here we see the first War King being used, but it's into a regroup. <laughs> So Baked Goods doesn't even have to spend Rage to boost the War King because Regroup's only the one value. And now Regroup also drew Joshua a card, which is yet another oh, risky risky move. It's very interesting with the with the decision of, of which attacks to use. Ooh, Ooh ouch. Another regroup. That hurts. There's the last ah. Brendel on a Regroup, but yet again, Joshua is drawing another card. And Baked Goods could deal the damage yeah. it looks like he chooses not to because it's robin so it wouldn't make much difference going from eight to seven as it would maybe killing an outlaw absolutely yeah we we're seeing that double attack that joshua has had and and it it appears as he he just wanted to use that to potentially bait some of those important cards out of baked goods hands and and we do see two uh very key cards especially that grendel that that's going to be uh, a major turning point potentially and let's see if uh if Joshua has time to capitalize on that because he still has a couple of hunter's eyes and and that disarming shot and ambush. There, There's a little bit that he can use to work with. Definitely. Tristan, um, can you confirm this for me? Are they both down to four defenses? I, Robin Hood is down to four defenses. Beowulf is also down to four, yes. Wow. So Beowulf has two War Kings, so they are value one, but they can be increased depending on how much rage they are spent. And Skirmish, which is a value four, which uh, is a huge That's defense a card for for Baked Goods as well with, with the Beowulf pick there. Uh, with Robin Hood, we still see one more Defenders of Sherwood, and then we have a Feint, a Snark, and a Wily fighting. Okay. This is interesting. If Beowulf can get in with the Ancient Heirloom, that card boosts up to an eight value maximum. So Robin Hood's best defense is a three, which means that would be five damage, bringing Robin Hood down to three health. Thinking about that though, interestingly enough, is there's a big difference in fatigue when it comes from three health down to two, because two means you will die in a single maneuver in fatigue, whereas three health means you can survive one maneuver to get one last attack in. So that might actually make a difference in the end here. Well, and uh, Beowulf still has three passes, I think, and Robin, you know, has none. That's, That's right. True. But I, I think it's more of a matter of Robin Hood running Beow out of defenses and then getting those big undefended attacks in at this point, rather than fatigue, because there's six cards left in deck. That's basically six turns of maneuvering and attacking. And, attack and with only four defenses... I don't know if Beowulf's going to be able to survive all this. Yeah. Well, you know, and there's not much left uh, in Josh's attack arsenal that you don't want to defend. Oh, that could hurt. Oh, and because this no. was an outlaw attacking, he, Baked Goods couldn't risk wasting a defense into a highway robbery and getting it canceled. 
So here yeah. we see the first ambush, which could definitely yeah. swing the game. If it hits like a golden drinking horn or one of Baked Goods' defenses. Oh, I, couldn't do that. I would love to see a golden drinking horn being pulled here. It's oh, a pass and yes. the, ooh, not not as great, uh, but takes out the pass and uh, two extra damage is still huge. Yeah, that's a four yeah. value ambush because the two value boost from Vigor being added on to its base of two, that's four damage and a card lost. And Vigor was also a pass and a discard of the opponent's card, which could be crucial at this point. Yeah. There's still a good amount of explosive attacks left to be played. Like, Robin Hood still has one more ambush and two Hunter's Eyes, along with a couple highway robberies to, you know, do a bit of chip damage. Mm -hmm. So the and two highway robberies that, could deal four guaranteed into Beowulf's eight, and then he just needs four absolutely. more. Absolutely. And because Beowulf doesn't have any feints, he, those ambushes will go through as well, and that's going to be huge if he can get a good pull. On the flip side, Beowulf still has those fatal struggles to, to keep his hand up and their four value attacks as well. Uh, those two ancient heirlooms that we've yet to see, and then uh, if he can get enough rage and epic poem, like it's it's going to come down to uh, yeah, just how you play those cards. What it, you know, can you bait out some of those strong attacks? Can you position yourself in a great way so that uh, you're forcing your opponent to you know potentially discard some of those. Oh, he throws an ancient heirloom into the outlaw. Ooh. But Joshua didn't defend, so that means defenders of Sherwood didn't bring back another guy, which is pretty good, mm. which might let Beowulf have an opportunity eventually to get Robin Hood himself. Yep. And Baked maintains all his rage. He used ancient heirloom and didn't have to spend anything. Yep. Absolutely. And I, I like that because you're not going to get too full value ancient heirloom attacks on Robin at this point in the game. I don't think Joshua would let that happen. He might get a chance for one of them, but I don't think he'd get a chance for two. So I think using one of those here to kill an outlaw was okay. Yeah, saving that rage for for some big attacks later on with that ancient heirloom. It it's uh it still keeps that threat alive because if if you use all of those rage, like the maximum amount of damage you can do, two of those rage bumps it up to a five value, add another rage to boost it with a card, bring it to eight. If if you can get Robin Hood, uh, even with any of the defenses, that means that, uh, um, you know, you can take down uh, a good chunk of Robin Hood's damage. And also, it's interesting to note that in Fatigue, all of your characters take the two damage. So if it does make it to that point, Joshua's going to lose his outlaws as well, which means that will give an opening for Beowulf to get Robin Hood with that final blow. I think Joshua needs to uh, uh, be ready to strike. Oh, but that's going to be this. a little bit tough. I love this Good position because the Great. max movement for the outlaw is five. So one, two, three, four, five would not reach Beowulf since outlaws are melee. Yeah. But oh, it looks like Robin see. did kill off Wiglaf, and he can use his ability to jump forward mm -hmm. and then hit Beowulf mm -hmm. as his second action. But that might leave him open to a big attack that he doesn't want to be taking at this point, especially only having three cards in hand. Not only that, but he used one of his very few defenses there to attack. He's down to three defense cards. Which is a feint, a defender's, which draws a card, and a wily fighting, correct? Yes. Tristan, is that right? Uh, Faint Defender, yes. Cool. We have Faint Defenders and Wily Fighting left for those defenses. Now I got to expect Beowulf takes this opportunity to get his attack in. And then maybe he has like a Skirmish and a War King to defend the double counterattack from Robin. Yeah, if I were Baked Goods, I would just move into there, uh, take the boost, uh, and, and get in for a big swing. Joshua uh, can afford to, you know, lay back a little bit. He, he can afford there to he goes. take a couple of double maneuvers and draw off his hand. Uh, and yeah, we're seeing that Fatal Struggle being used to boost, so that's, that's going to be huge. I think a Fatal Struggle boost into a Fatal Struggle attack, hoping to bait out that feint, would be kind of good. Mm. I can't imagine Joshua ever throwing a feint with three rage, though. Oh, but he did. Oh, but he and did. And go. it pays off. 
Wow. Not only does that cancel the working's value in full, but working is a defense that he doesn't have anymore. That was huge. That was really big. Yep. Yeah. That, that's going to be major. Now, I wonder if that second heirloom is buried in his deck of nine cards that he still has left, which is about a third of his deck. And if that's the case, he might be regretting having played that earlier heirloom into the outlaw. Well, one thing we know about Robin is Robin's got two defense left. So Robin might start playing a little defensively now. And one of those defenses draws a card. Yeah. Which, although it would bring back an outlaw, it's not really going to help him much. And this is a really bad position for Robin Hood to be in because he backed off. So he drew a good amount of cards there. He Did he double maneuver, it looks like? It looked like he doubled maneuver, yeah. but he didn't move behind any of those outlaws. I think the the thing is, if he moves behind the outlaws, Baked Goods just double maneuvers because he can. Yeah. And, and means Joshua then has to play a little bit harder. He only has, uh, was it, three cards left in that deck? Yeah. If I'm seeing that three correct. Three cards. So uh, all of these are, are vital. So I think Joshua stays there and just to, you know, hopefully take this hit and uh, be able wow. to. Wow. Oh. There it is. Do. Yep. Here we have defenders. Although, this could end the game because yep. although here's five damage dealt, Joshua gets to reborn a an outlaw behind Beowulf pinning him, which is a big problem. And maybe Joshua is trying to bait that move. Absolutely. I think if he gets that outlaw behind and goes for a, a double attack because he, he now has is. those five cards. Yep, there we go. What a play. Uh, uh, let's see if we can see uh, um, uh, some big attacks here and if Baked Goods has some defenses. I know he still has the War King and the two skirmishes, I believe. Yeah, by my count, that's right. I'd yeah. like to see a... S <laughs> oh, man. Who, I, I wonder, who's attacking, Robin or? Uh, the Outlaw. Oh. Okay. Oh, interesting. So okay. here's the mind games, but Baked Goods is... He's... He can't really risk an ambush, I wouldn't think. There's... See, yeah, there, there's that ambush. And, and the other thing, there's that Wily fighting, but he still has at least one highway robbery, if not two. I think if, Baked Goods saw Robin the opportunity to get his attack, but that might have been a mistake going in there. He maybe should have just backed off and let Joshua maybe fatigue if nice. if beowulf can survive right now robin only has one defense left so if beowulf stays and double attacks robin next turn that could also end it that's i can true. see though that's here true. i i i don't know if this is attack with robin yeah it's going to be a robin hood if now that robin hood is attacked he's gonna hide behind that uh that one outlaw so oh, that is gonna that that oh. him. changes yep, everything right there to is. to hit that outlaw if you want to even have a shot at Robin Hood. Wow. So this is, you know, what do you do here? Do you? I, I would almost hit that outlaw behind Beowulf, the the one out to the left side right there, and take him out and maneuver out of there. Just just get out uh, as far as you can uh, to force again some more mm -hmm. card draw here. He's maneuvering though, and Robin's set up to double attack, and he still has another hunter's eye, and there's another ambush. So. If uh, Baked Goods doesn't kill an outlaw here, he has to end adjacent to one of those two outlaws regardless, which means an outlaw could hit and probably get a undefended attack, and Robin could maybe finish the job. Double maneuver. Mm, I was over. thinking maybe he would drinking horns up to seven, but no. Right. I wonder mm. if, he, if he just is hoping for a couple more defenses. He has those two left, but... Uh, uh, yeah, this is going to be an opportunity for Joshua to take this home. I think this is it, if I had to guess. I think Robin Hood's going to take it here. Because even, even looking at the cards in his, in his deck, we have one Hunter's Eye, an Ambush, a Highway Robbery, a Piercing Shot, and a Wily Fighting here. Two of those cards are in the deck. If he, can, if he hits with an Outlaw, with even with that highway robbery and or the wily fighting uh, um again beowulf doesn't have any feints there are no feints left in either person's deck or in their hands we're seeing them looking through 
all the hands, just making sure that they they know exactly uh, what is in the opponent's hand as well, or, or what's left in their deck. Um, yeah, taking that time, uh, and that's that's huge. Um, you, know, you know, every every attack here is going to count. We we know that Beowulf has two defenses left, but there's a lot of cards in his deck. Wow. And he just maneuvered. He twice. maneuvered. Joshua just maneuvered. That means Beowulf, if he has a defense, he won't die here. Very the, interesting. Well, unless it's an ambush, right? If the ambush hits a, a three value boost out of Fake Goods' hand. Goods, if Fake Goods doesn't defend. Right. But there's only, what, one robbery left? So he could defend, maybe. But Joshua's going to have to maneuver again next turn if Fake Goods can get out of this pin. Okay, here it comes. Oh, the such there's the a ambush. Win. One, two, three. Here. That's gonna be huge. Such a, that that's yeah. major. Oh no! But it does oh, deal the damage. Oh, and ouch! Yeah. And that's I think that's defense right there. That's the last one. Yeah, he yeah. has no defense. I left. think that's game over, unfortunately. <laughs> the only path to victory I see is killing the outlaw. And then using Golden Drinking Horn, he's probably digging for Golden Drinking Horn. He can use all three effects to move and heal, and he gets up to six, which means Robin can't kill him with the last Hunter's Eye. But he has to have the Drinking Horn here. That's the only big if. That's the only way out. There's and no even then, like yeah, he he's not going to be able to move out at all. So Robin Hood's going to get two free attacks. Well, he can maneuver out, and Robin would have to draw his last card, but then the the Hunter's Eye is going to kill him. As, yeah, uh, as he maneuvered, as... so it's game over. Yep. I'm pretty sure that's it. If Joshua... Well, he's going to maneuver and draw his last card, so he does have that Hunter's Eye guaranteed. Yep. Is he attacking with that? Outlaw, Wily fighting. Mm. Wily fighting there. Oh, that's yep. it. There's three plus the one. What a game. There we go. There we go. Wow, that Absolutely was so incredibly amazing. Close. What a tense game. And we had, it, it was very interesting. We had seen the, the tide shift back and forth a couple of times in this game where it seemed to have favored Robin Hood and then Beowulf kind of going back and forth. And, and just what an exciting finish and there we see the those cards remaining in joshua's hand um yeah absolutely well played by joshua to, just to keep that pressure up to keep playing aggressive what a game that was Did you not let's get, listen into the players a little bit if we can you not get fatal struggle usually that's how you keep up with robin in the draw and kill outlaws really easily yeah i wasn't I guess I wasn't really trying to. Like I noticed the ah. card disparity, and I just wanted to let you. Yeah, that, that is that is true. I think what got me was I... that one turn where you double attack me as Robin with like a regroup. Yeah, the double regroup. Else. Yeah, it that was, was a double regroup. Yeah, that was because uh, I wasted a War King and a Grendel that turn. And I think yes. that was that was really bad for me. Yeah. If... Yeah. Wow, what a game. Uh, well, your, your positioning was really good. <laughs> I, I, uh, no, I actually, I, I'm not sure. It was... You see how many cards I had a boost with? I, yeah. I kept... I kept... You made me boost, so that's number one. You kept... You used Wigloff well. I was regretting, especially after the Starmie Trump shot. I, I knew I had to finish him off. If you body block like you kept doing, I'm never going to finish you. Yeah. Yep, good point by Joshua yes, about the body blocking with Wigloff. That's his number one job. <laughs> All right, what a game that was, guys. Such an explosive back and forth game one. So now we're looking at Joshua. He just needs to get a win with Bigfoot. And with Bigfoot being one of the big three, I think that's pretty likely he's got two tries to do it, although he has to go up against Muldoon, who I got to expect Baked Goods is going to be playing next uh, to counter Bigfoot and at least force a Game 3 situation. 
And then it comes down to Beowulf versus Bigfoot. And Beowulf can beat Bigfoot. It's not easy, but it can happen because those Grendels can be huge. If Bigfoot's not able to bait out the Grendels with smaller attacks, he's just at risk of taking massive recoil damage. And he mm -hmm. has no healing, so uh, it's an interesting matchup for sure. I would almost, uh, especially because now that Baked Goods has lost this round, he gets to choose the map and position next. Considering we know InGen is a, a decent fighter against Bigfoot, I would almost love to see him pick Beowulf into Bigfoot this this round. Try to make the most of this uh, map and position advantage to give him the, the best shot he can. And then hit him with the InGen uh, in Game 3 if it goes to that. Yeah, you know, in order to win, he has to win with Beowulf. So he could get a point in right now if he wins with Injun, but to Tristan's point, he could set himself up for a disadvantage in the final the match. I, I say just go Beowulf right now because you're not getting any points anymore for, for one game. Right, it's not Swiss anymore. This is elimination, so it's make or break. And uh, although as much as I'd love to see a game three, so I'm hoping he goes with Muldoon and gets that win and then we get to see the game three showdown, uh, I do think it would be the smart play by Baked Goods to go ahead and go with Beowulf while you have that map and position advantage. So we're going to see what happens. They're going to be, he's going to, he's got a hard decision to make, I think, Baked Goods does. And what would you think would be a map that he could use to get a little advantage? With Beowulf? Yeah. So I think something like Baskerville is really good in that case because. Beowulf can often just play a defensive game against Bigfoot, and he has the chance to maneuver through secret passages to get far away, and then so he can do a maneuver and then a scheme, and often he does want to be using those schemes, but Bigfoot being as aggressive as he can, um, Beowulf doesn't have a lot of opportunities, so because he has to double maneuver, and especially with Bigfoot's movement speed of three, and Beowulf only has two, he has to double maneuver four spaces away to get out of range of Bigfoot. So he can't afford to just do a single maneuver and, and scheme. But with Baskerville, he can get through the passages, and that lets him do that. Great point. But do we have information on map bands? Maybe that will help us uh, make a prediction here. I don't know which maps they banned initially, so I don't even know. Baskerville might not be on the table. Well, I only know their precedent, and Big Goods has actually banned Baskerville for a third of his matches. So, it, I he might have done it again. So, no. it looks like Baked Goods banned Soho, which makes sense, uh, mm -hmm. going up against Robin Hood in the lineup. And uh, Joshua did ban Baskerville. Ah, okay. So, mm -hmm. that is off the table. There's not that option anymore. So, I don't know. I think it's going to be really hard for Beowulf. Um, kind of regardless, though I do think a map maybe like Sherwood again would be helpful because you can put Wigloff in front and take a couple of hits from Bigfoot. Uh, although not too many, I don't think, because Bigfoot can just hit him hard with those six value attacks and whatnot and just get him out of the way early. But it's still, you know, a couple of attacks soaked up is better than none. True. Yep. Yeah. I would say a map that is a little bit more, uh, almost smaller, one that you can probably, you know, if you if you think of it like a boxing ring, if he can position himself as Beowulf in the center of this, you know, metaphorical boxing ring so that he can uh, be able to maneuver right up next to Bigfoot wherever he needs to to land those big hits. I do think that, um, you know, being able to get in and, and get those hits is going to be key. And so I would love to see a bit of a, a smaller pick and, and Sherwood would fit the bill quite perfectly for that that's true um because in my mind i'm thinking beowulf wants to play a strong defensive game and that's why i mentioned baskerville but also beowulf can do pretty good on offense against bigfoot because he's got a lot of heavy hitting attacks and the heirlooms can't be canceled by bigfoot's many cancels so you know maybe you do want a smaller stage like that uh tristan like a boxing ring and just have beowulf have the opportunity to get in there when he needs to so that he can maximize the efficiency of his rage. Yeah, wind condition is definitely going to be Grendel's getting off some really big damage, and then Heirloom's landing over cancels. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And also, I think um, that Fatal Struggle isn't likely to land, but if you can Fatal Struggle into mm -hmm. some of the cancels, that's damage, and then you don't have to draw, so that would be ideal as well. 
Can yep. I think going uh, there. there's going to be a little bit of uh, uh, deciding in regards to Beowulf as to uh, when to take some sacrifices, both in, in regards to like which cards to boost, and, and then as well because he has that high damage, not necessarily taking undefended attacks because, or at least not too many, because Bigfoot has some heavy hitting attacks. Yep. But yeah. you know when to kind of, uh, uh, yeah, take take a little bit of a weaker defense. You know maybe play War King just for you know uh, uh, the one or the three damage uh, negated. So. Uh, it's. It, I feel like in this matchup, Beowulf is going to have to do a little bit of picking and choosing, and Baked Goods is gonna gonna need to make a couple of sacrifices in order to get the hits he needs to take out Bigfoot. Right. Yeah, it's it's not an easy one, but it could go either way. The mind games are huge, but uh, looks like the players are getting set up for their game. We'll have the fighter picks in just a moment. So let's go ahead and uh, for anybody new tuning in, let's show you how. Uh, Unmatched works, what it is, and uh, why we play this game. Unmatched is a card-based tactical fighting game featuring various characters from history, literature, and fantasy. The goal? Reduce the opposing hero's health to zero. Players take turns performing any combination of two actions from maneuvering, scheming, or attacking. A maneuver causes the player to draw a card from their deck and lets them move any of their fighters around the board. They may increase the distance of their move by discarding a card known as a boost. When a scheme card is played, simply follow the text on the card to complete the action. For an attack, the turn player will choose a card from their hand to place face down for combat. The opponent will have the option to place one of their cards down as defense. The value on the cards will determine the damage dealt in combat. Melee fighters can only attack adjacent spaces, while ranged fighters can also attack any space within their color-coordinated zone. Some characters have sidekicks to help them out, and others fight solo. Each hero has their own unique abilities and deck of cards to bring the character to life. Because in battle, there are no equals. All right, so it looks like we are going to have uh, Muldoon coming out versus Bigfoot, and it Ooh. is going to be played on Marmoreal. So mm. I think Baked Goods, you got to think his mindset is that he just wants to put the pressure on Joshua and maybe make him mess up, you know, make some misplays in game three to try and win the match. Because with Josh fresh off a win, his confidence is high right now, so maybe... You know, he just wants to make a higher pressure situation by taking it to game three. Yeah, I think that's a good call. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Like, you're were, <laughs> like you were saying, uh, yeah, that the mental game is just as important, and, and um, making sure to to um, you, know, I, I can assume that Baked Goods is hoping to get a win and, and try to throw Joshua a little bit off guard, trying to to get that momentum back with this pick uh and, and so yeah it's going to be very interesting to see how that plays out overall let's see if josh can uh can um take this game too and and uh redeem himself yeah i mean as we you know saw at the beginning of the match when we talked about their track record there is precedent for baked goods pulling out a win and then kind of throwing joshua off his game uh thereafter so i think it's a good play yeah, and uh, I think this map, too, definitely helps Muldoon a lot because of all of those multi-zone spaces there that you can see with the multiple different colors. That means it's part of each of those zones all at once. And with Muldoon being a ranged fighter and having all ranged sidekicks, it really gives him control of the map as well as his ability to place down traps, which when a trap is hit, the fighter has to stop moving and take a damage, and then Muldoon also gets to draw a card from that so he just has huge map control on a map like Marmoreal. I often think of this as the Muldoon map. <laughs> so it's a, it's a good pick. It's a good play. But, you know, I really wouldn't count Joshua out just yet. Bigfoot is a strong fighter, and Josh does have that fire to beat Big Goods and get that revenge for that earlier win in the tournament. That is true. So with that said, let's take a look at Muldoon's deck.
So looking at Muldoon, also known as InGen, his key cards, he's got They Should All Be Destroyed, which is that red value 4, which says during combat it adds one value to the attack for each trap adjacent to the opposing fighter. So uh, a big move that we saw Prospero make in the previous tourney is using that bottom right card, Call for Backup, which Call for Backup, you choose multiple effects. You can either place up to three traps, place all of your defeated InGen workers back in Muldoon's zone, or draw two cards, and you get two out of the three. So we would see Prospero place all of the defeated workers as well as place traps down surrounding the opponent and then attack with they should all be destroyed as his second action, which is a massive value attack because of all those adjacent traps. And even if fainted or canceled, it still is a, you know, a base value of four. So that's still good damage. And yeah. uh, looking at the next card there, Leap Away is one of Muldoon's key defenses. It can be used at, from a worker or Muldoon himself. And if you win combat, you get to move one of the fighters up to four spaces, which is, again, just good position control. And I've hunted most things that can hunt you. That four value blue for Muldoon is his best defense because it lets him move all of his fighters up to five spaces. You don't have to win the combat, so it's not conditional. And also you can move through opposing fighters. So you get to basically just position everybody exactly how you want on the map going into your turn for your trap placement and all of your attacks and whatnot. So that is the best defense he has. There's only two copies of those in the deck and there's only three leap aways. So not a whole lot of defense in Muldoon's deck. That's his weakness. And looking at rending shot, that's just another common attacker, which is four copies of. So you're going to see it often and it moves the opposing fighter up to three spaces after combat. So although it's not very strong at a three value, it's again, just great map control. So with all of that, let's take a look at Bigfoot's deck. And Bigfoot is just king of big numbers. So you see that first larger than life. That's the log, we call it. And it's just a flat six value attack that there's three copies in the deck. So it's just a massive blow. Savagery is if you win the combat, you deal a damage to each fighter adjacent to Bigfoot. There's three copies of that. And at a four value, it's relatively likely to win the combat and trigger its effect. And if you're adjacent to multiple in-gen workers here, you're going to kill multiple for one card, which is a big win in combat. And then Jackalope Horns, the Jackalope is J uh, Bigfoot's sidekick, which is basically an extension of Bigfoot himself because Bigfoot has so many any cards in his deck, which means that either Bigfoot or Jackalope can play those cards. And with the Jackalope Horns, there's three copies, which lets Jackalope move up to five spaces through opposing fighters and deal two damage to an adjacent fighter. So you can charge him across the board unexpectedly through people and deal two damage, and then you can either make an attack as your second action or you can just back Jackalope off to safety. And then looking at It's Just Your Imagination, we talked about how important Faint is earlier, and that is that two value versatile that cancels all effects on your opponent's card, but Just Your Imagination also cancels just like a Faint would, but it's a three value instead of a two, though it can only be used on defense, not an attack. But that essentially gives Bigfoot five cancel cards in deck, which is more than any other fighter. And then Hoax is just a super solid card attack or defense for value after combat move your fighter up to five spaces and you can move through opposing fighters as well so it's similar to Muldoon's blue card uh, on defense and hoax is really good in this matchup for setting up unexpected attack opportunities onto Muldoon himself because Muldoon doesn't have a lot of quantity of defenses so every hit you can get in counts so hoax is going to be key for getting in there as well as cards like jackalope horns Trap positioning is going to be key to avoid hoax. Hmm. Yep, I was about to say the same thing with Muldoon, uh, with the ability to throw traps and stop any sort of movement. That that those traps are going to be absolutely key, and it is one of the reasons why Injun can do well into Bigfoot is because he yeah uh, he can stop that incredibly high mobility that Bigfoot has. Exactly, because to note, you can move through opposing fighters with the hoax and the jackalope horns, but you cannot keep moving if you hit a trap because you have to stop your movement on that space. Um, but one thing that you can do is if there is a fighter on top of the trap already, since you can't stop on the same space as another fighter, you can keep moving through the trap. You still take the damage, Muldoon still draws the card, but you can continue your movement. So the Muldoon player has to be cognizant of that interaction and play around it at all times because sometimes Muldoon gets into fatigue scenarios if he places too many traps too quickly 
And then when it gets to the late game, if the opponent avoided those traps throughout the game, now all of a sudden, especially with Bigfoot with that high mobility, he can pop multiple traps in a turn and force Muldoon to draw multiple cards, which can suddenly force fatigue upon Muldoon when it otherwise wouldn't have. Yeah, I think a very small and subtle thing, and you touched a little bit on this, uh, John, uh, is, is that uh, the, the card draw here. Uh, we don't see many, if any at all, where, where they have a lot of card draw in the decks themselves. But for, for InGen with those traps being able to draw cards and for Bigfoot with his ability to uh, draw a card if he's in a completely different zone, uh, it, it's going to be very interesting to see how that affects the matchup and, and uh, um, you know, whether they're going to play to have those big hands or, or whether, you know, someone could pull out some aggressive strategy and, and just uh, um, try and negate their opponent from drawing cards. Uh, it's... It, it's a very small thing in this matchup, but something that that does play a, a decent role. Definitely. Yeah, big time. I think, you know, it's been said before, Muldoon doesn't have many defense cards comparatively, especially compared mm -hmm. to Bigfoot. So the key is just going to be um, not getting attacked. Controlling the map, positioning your fighters properly, positioning the traps and everything, that is going to be huge. And you mentioned earlier, Tristan, that this is going to be Baked Goods' 15th new fighter this tournament. So just to John's uh, point about there's got to be a lot of familiarity with this matchup and this fighter and a lot of know-how about the positioning. So we'll see if, you know, the jack-of-all-trades kind of doesn't work out here because this, this could require intimate knowledge. That is a great point, John, um, because this is not an easy matchup. And I know people tend to say that Muldoon is just a, a straight up counter to Bigfoot and I am one of the few people I think that argue otherwise I think it's very even and really depends on the more skilled player I think there, if there's a skill mm -hmm. gap and somebody makes mistakes it's going to cost them the game because this matchup is so close and Bigfoot does have a lot of ways to play around the strengths of Muldoon he can get in there probably better than any other not any other fighter but better than most fighters with all those movement effects and with those logs that Bigfoot has, every single time he hits with a log, it's guaranteed to do at least two damage, if not more. If Muldoon defends with a feint, the log is going to deal four damage. Um, that's his only other option, other than his fours. So if he doesn't have a four and Bigfoot hits with the log, that's trouble. Especially with the three Jackalope horns, that is six auto damage throughout the course of the game, if all those can be pulled off before Jackalope dies. You take the three logs, which is two apiece, that's six three jackalope horns, two apiece, that's six. That's 12 damage out of Muldoon's 14 health, and he has no ability to heal. So Bigfoot just needs to find two more damage somehow, whether that be running Muldoon out to fatigue, or if Muldoon ever defends one of those logs with a feint, that's that other two damage that is needed to seal out the game. So it's a very clear-cut win condition for Bigfoot, although it's not easy. And it really just depends on how well the Muldoon player can keep Bigfoot away, like you mentioned. Yeah. All yeah, great the, point. the positioning is going to be huge here. I, I I often like to to see Ingen as someone who likes to kind of hunker down and, and kind of use his traps and defenses to to keep his opponents away from him. And it's all going to be finding those cracks and and being able to uh, ex exploit the those chances for for Bigfoot or for Ingen, being able to to minimize those chances and and being able to to cover that that up. I think there's a level of finesse that goes into a matchup like this that is uh, just incredibly important to watch to see if Joshua can get in and, and get those big hits against InGen when he doesn't have the defenses. And playing off of what you said too is that I know that Baked Goods, like you said, he doesn't really play much Muldoon at all. So he's kind of out of his comfort mm -hmm. zone, which can definitely be a big disadvantage in this matchup in particular because there's so many things to think about with Muldoon. It's almost like information overload, right? You got to think about yeah. your trap placement, whether or not you want to place a trap at all at the start of your turn. Then you have to think about positioning not only Muldoon, but three workers, keeping mm -hmm. the traps in mind as well and managing your hand count and your defenses. And there's just a lot to think about in this matchup. It's one of the most difficult matchups on both sides to navigate, I would say. And on the flip side, Joshua doesn't play much Bigfoot. I play with him all the time, and he's not a Bigfoot player. Uh, I think he took him just because maybe he knows that 
Baked Goods is uh, not familiar with Muldoon, so maybe he thinks he can still take the win on that matchup, even though he's not super familiar with Bigfoot himself. But I think both players are a little bit out of their comfort zone here, so it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Yeah, I think to the point about how difficult this matchup will be is we spent a lot of time just talking about how Bigfoot can win and how Muldoon can survive. But we didn't even talk about, well, how does Muldoon win? You know, there's <laughs> <laughs> like, this is a very difficult matchup. Yeah, and I think the Muldoon's main win condition, again, survive is step one is survive. But step right. two, right. I, he can run Bigfoot out of defenses in the long run, although Bigfoot does have a lot and they're really good quality. Muldoon has a ton of attacks. All those rending shots, those they should all be destroyed. He's got um, second shots. He's got so many mm -hmm. attacks. And he can even afford to use things like feint as an attack because mm -hmm. your game plan is not to defend with a feint because then you risk taking that extra two damage over the log. So that's you want to avoid that. So you want to use your feints to attack. And so you just have so many attacks that if you can keep Muldoon protected and just keep using the workers to bully Bigfoot, basically, and just keep attacking, you will run him out of defense in the long run. How, how do you factor the Jackalope into Muldoon's win condition? You have to kill Jackalope, I think, yep. as soon as possible as Muldoon. That's step one of your victory. Absolutely. I was about to say the same thing. Uh, Jackalope needs to be eliminated, though that extra two damage is huge and two undefended hits. Like you can't, There's no way you can yep. negate any of that. Um, that you need to get rid of Jackalope ASAP. And he has six health. Uh, granted, he also has a lot of defenses with all of those Ennies, uh, those any cards. But uh, it, it, if you can whittle down that six health, it, he should be a little bit easier to take down. And, and that will, that will that's going to be a huge factor as well. 100%. And six health is not that much, actually, when you consider all things with the trap damage, potentially, and Muldoon's big attacks. And the thing is, too, that... Um, Jackalope, every time he defends, it's just like attacking Bigfoot because they're all Ennies on defense. So every card that Jackalope uses to defend with is another card Bigfoot isn't going to have down the line when it gets to the later stages of the game. So you don't even feel bad about attacking Jackalope. And even if you can negate one Jackalope horns, that's two extra damage that Bigfoot's going to have to find somehow. And that's very difficult to do. So Bigfoot has to keep Jackalope alive and pull off all three of those horns to have a good shot at winning this matchup. So it looks like the players are set up, so let's get into the game and see what happens. So it looks like first they gotta decide whether or not they're gonna keep or mulligan their hands, and that could be a make or break moment here. An uh, interesting thing to note right off the bat is that Baked Goods got to choose, and he chose to go second which gives Bigfoot the initiative here to try to make an aggressive push and maybe at least kill off a worker off the bat to make it a little bit easier to reach Muldoon in the early game. Or he can just double maneuver and he gets the first hand advantage and can go in on the following turn. Yeah, I would love to see uh, an aggressive start. Uh, like, I, I think if you give Muldoon too much of a foothold, to, to you know get his system up and running I, it, it can be a little tough to to penetrate that and and to get in to deal the the damage you need so i i would love to see a, a bit of a more aggressive strategy um but yeah we're it seems like we have the mulligan from baked goods so once again uh maybe picking up a uh a, a not optimal hand uh and it's gonna be interesting to see how that plays out right um so joshua kept and baked goods mulligan huh yeah, I mean, yeah. if you're starting, if you're starting second, you probably don't want to start with minimal defense. I, I think that was probably going to be key there. I agree. Right. Although he can easily just block Muldoon off with workers, but you still, you know, you don't want to rely on drawing a defense out of your next two cards on your turn because then if you don't draw one, and Bigfoot Bigfoot kills a worker turn one on Bigfoot's turn two, he can go in and hit you. And you can't afford to take any extra damage, as we talked about. Right. Exactly. Though I do think that Baked Goods probably has a fatigue win condition in mind, and thus that would be the reason why he would choose to go second, because Bigfoot has to be the one to take the first draw out of his deck. Interesting play. Mm. Okay. 
Another thing to watch out for as Muldoon is making sure that you don't leave a lot of savagery opportunities for multiple workers to die off. Right, this map is very interconnected at many places, and so if you get caught, especially towards the middle of the map, and, and uh, Bigfoot can get in with a savagery, uh, that is that is going to be a major point. I mean, it might be telegraphed, and, and you can potentially faint around it, around it, but that's still another two damage, and it's it's that's a huge deal. Right, and another thing you can do against it is you could defend with a leap away, which means Bigfoot won't win the combat because it's four to four and so it won't trigger mm. the savagery, but that's a precious four value defense that you would be using on a worker instead of yep. Muldoon. So yep. that's a big risk and you can yeah. safeguard against the savagery, but also if it's not savagery and if it's momentous shift, you will still, the worker will still die from the shift because that bumps to a five over top the leap mm. away. So it's a huge risk to even do that. Definitely not ideal, no matter how you slice it. Right. Exactly. So the best thing you can do is just play around your positioning and don't let those opportunities arise. Okay. And here we do see ooh, ooh. Jackalope attacking with a disengage here, killing off a worker who did not defend. So now Jackalope gets to go to any other space in his zone, which is this blue, green, or brown. Hmm. So he goes all the way to the other side. So that kind of flanks Muldoon here right off the bat, which is going to put some pressure on baked goods real quick. Yep, I like this positioning. I, I like the fact that he had placed the jackalope out there, uh, kind of forcing uh, baked goods to to um, yeah into a corner, yeah. and we'll see what he does with with that. But uh, it's it's very interesting. Absolutely, a strong opening turn. You get rid of one of the workers, and you get this great positioning. Yeah, fantastic positioning because Muldoon, he can't really. There's no real good spots to go. If he wants to hit Bigfoot, he has to be adjacent, basically, because this space here is in different zones, the tri-color. Uh, and then the pink one with the the yellowish is more than three spaces away, so that's out of maneuver range. That it'd have to be a boost. So Bigfoot's pretty safe unless, you know, uh, Baked Goods tries to go adjacent, and that's a little risky. I think we're seeing right off the bat the fuel Joshua has for his revenge in this matchup. I would say so. This is a tough opening position for Baked Goods. Let's see if he can pull out of this. It's nowhere near over, but this is really going to be where his Muldoon inexperience may come to haunt him. Definitely far from over. As we saw last match, it can go back and forth on the turn of a dime. Yep. So he does place down a trap. So Muldoon does start with eight traps. Uh, so they are finite. He doesn't just get to keep placing them. Once a trap is popped, it is removed completely from the game. The good thing with those traps here is the fact that he can utilize those traps to, to help him with, uh, uh, you know, some of his maneuvers and uh, as far as where he can position. Because now that he placed his trap there, it allows him to move towards that bottom center area. And if Bigfoot wants to attack uh, Muldoon, well, now that trap's going to be in the way. <laughs> and the double regroup. Wow. The double regroup. So this is a rare but very funny interaction when the defender defends with the regroup and into the attacker's regroup. The winner of the regroup combat draws two cards. So that would be the defender in this case, meaning Bigfoot drew two and uh, Muldoon only drew one, which is actually beneficial for Muldoon because if he's looking to play with fatigue in mind, that's a, that's a big win. Though I think you would have rather gotten a big attack into Jackalope with that regroup defense because then you're potentially taking him out really early in the game, which would have been huge. So right. Not, not I think what you want to see. No, I think there was a, a, a hope for a, a bait, like uh, uh, one of those feints. Uh, but yeah, Joshua played that very well with just, just countering with that other regroup and and it worked out uh, to his favor incredibly well. And now we're seeing a bit attack from Bigfoot here. Definitely a good read. Oh, there's savagery. 
Savagery. Savagery doesn't kill more than one worker because he wasn't adjacent yep. to multiple. But it does kill the one over this defense card. But now he gets to move the other engine worker up to two spaces if he wishes, which can set him up to double attack Bigfoot if he wanted to. But it looks like he is going to back sure off. He loved to see him laughing about this play. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Definitely good sportsmanship here. Yeah, the aggressive strategy working out for Joshua very, very well, taking out two of those workers. He Muldoon only has the one trap and the one worker so far to defend himself against, but he can place another trap here. Uh, but yeah, uh, Joshua's doing very well at, at kind of minimizing that. Uh, and who knows, maybe because Baked Goods had the mulligan, he might not have had uh, great cards such as a call for backup or, or any of those solid defenses, and he still might, con considering he had to redraw, and you never know with the luck of the draw what what cards you get. Right. And that call for backup is huge because with two workers already gone, he's going to want to find one of those pretty soon so that he can get a better defensive wall going. Because every time Bigfoot kills a worker or attacks one, that's another card he has to spend that he won't have against Muldoon. And part of the reason why in the long game he can just run out of cards to attack and defend with. Yeah, call for backup. You know, usually you want to see that later, but the way this match is playing out, an earlier game call for backup with three traps and the workers all back could be a really good play. Right. Though Definitely gives strong map control. It's an interesting position here with Baked Goods putting Muldoon because Bigfoot can maneuver three spaces, pop that trap, and end adjacent to Muldoon and get an attack in. So I feel like maybe he should have moved him one more space further back. He's also open to horns. Jackalope horns, right. yep. That card's really hard to avoid though, you know, it's gonna if he's if Joshua's got it, it's gonna come out at some point. Oh, and there we see a leap away used to attack with. Which means the skirmish wins the combat because it was on defense, and now skirmish gets to push one of the fighters up to two spaces. Okay. So Muldoon is almost wide open here. Not a good position for baked goods, especially seeing that other four value defense used as an attack. Yeah, that that hurt. Oh, there it goes the trap. There, because there, pop the trap. Yep. There's five big defenses for Muldoon, and one of them gone already, so only four left. Not just gone, but used to do nothing in an yeah. attack. Oh, and here it is. Oh, no. Oh, There's no. There's the bait into the log. Oh, so now from here on scared. out, all Joshua needs to do is pull off all three horns and the other two logs, and it's game over. So I am I think it's really favoring Joshua at this point. Yeah, this is this is huge. That was, that was a huge turn of events. Like you said, I I almost would have lo have loved to have seen him uh, almost take a double maneuver into uh, to move Muldoon out of range because, like you said, uh, you have that opening and and Joshua went in and took it and, and that's a that's a huge attack. Yep, I think this is just showing the experience levels here. I I've talked to Joshua about this matchup a lot personally because I've dealt with this same matchup multiple times during my tourney run. And um, I, so I've discussed the win condition with Joshua a lot and he knows, so he's doing exactly what we talked about here. Um, yeah, and Baked I mean, Goods might not know because I would have even liked to see the feint used to attack and the save the leap away for defense, you know, do it the other way around. Right. Well, even in the positioning where he moved but he was, you know, if Bigfoot triggers his trap, he can still attack him like we just saw. That positioning to me is somebody who thinks, well, this trap is keeping me safe. But that's that's not at all true. I mean, at 16 health, Bigfoot doesn't mind taking taking one damage to come and hit you with larger than life, you know? Right, right. 
That's big yeah, that's that whole wind condition, so he doesn't care. He'll definitely trade a damage for getting a log in there. That large health plays really well into Bigfoot's favor, especially at this point in the game. He's only taken one uh, one point of damage between Bigfoot and Jackalope through all of the interactions, and so that's 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 a key part here. Yep. Yeah, the traps, the traps are important. I don't want to downplay them, but they are less important against somebody like Bigfoot who doesn't oh. care. He was about to leave Muldoon here again. One, two, three, Bigfoot onto the trap, hit Muldoon. So he caught that though, and looks like he is moving one space further to protect that. Good catch. Yep. Learning from the mistakes, and that's, that's, that's huge. Though Bigfoot can still just easily boost in and still hit him around from that other side. Oh, I see Baked Goods shaking his head. I don't think he's happy with this, how this one's turning out. You know, you make it this far in the tournament and you're consistently playing new new characters. Uh, based on what I know of Baked Goods, I think he'll be happy even if he loses just because, you know, he went out, he did something new, and he had some fun. Oh, definitely. You got to be happy with your placement at this point, regardless of Absolutely. the outcome. Absolutely. Yeah, especially considering the wide pool of players we've had in this tournament, 64 players, and to make it to the top four is a huge accomplishment. Oh. Mm. So that was not a log. So... It does knock one of those valuable blue defenses out, but it doesn't deal any damage. So this game is still far from over. Now Baked Goods has a tough decision trying to figure out where to move his fighters because he gets to move both Muldoon and the worker five spaces through opponents. So he can, and also he has hand advantage of six to four right now. So he can turn you know, the tides here and flip the aggression back onto Joshua, potentially. Absolutely. If you can get one great combat in, in the next little bit to, to turn the tides and get regain his foothold in that positioning game, I, I think this still could work out in his favor. Must be going for the jack low. Yeah, true. It does look like that's the case. Because again, if he kills jack low, he can save himself six damage from those jackalope horns, which is absolutely yep. a game changer. Yeah, definitely a, a bigger deal now than it was a few turns ago before yeah. he took four damage. Exactly. Bigfoot already got what he needed out of that log into the faint, so now it's just about jackalope. Whenever I say my turn, I'm always asking. All right, so here, let's see what Baked Goods decides to do. He could place a trap behind Jackalope. That almost pins Jackalope here. If oh. it, it lets him do a double, well, I guess if it's a hoax, Jackalope can get out by going through Muldoon and the worker. But if it's not hoax specifically, even if it's skirmish, Jackalope is going to be stuck getting double attack. But he does have There's the hoax. The Nice. Unfortunate for baked goods. He does attack with shooter, which becomes a five value instead of three if it's the first action, which it was. But that hoax getting out of the double attack range is huge. That's major. So now there's the one thing that he, he, he can do now, Bigfoot. though, is still uh, exactly he can attack Bigfoot, uh, try and stay aggressive. Oh, but he, mm. we're seeing a maneuver. He's going to do a maneuver. Interesting. I wonder if he didn't see the Bigfoot connection. You know, it's hard to see the brown underneath there. I, I got to imagine he knows the map, though, by heart, basically. But it's, again, easy to slip up on little things in a high-pressure situation. So. Absolutely. And maybe he just didn't feel very confident uh, um, moving into that uh, even with three cards, if if uh, you if he if Joshua can defend against a really great attack, it, it may not even matter. And so that's you know trying to take that time to regroup and and build up that hand and get get some traps down, maybe get to those call for backups. That could be huge. Yep. 
It does look like, based on Joshua's double man- maneuver turn afterward, that attacking Bigfoot might have been the smarter play. Yeah, because double maneuver means he might not have had defense in hand, or not much at least, and needed to regain some cards. Right. And now he's even out of a single maneuver attack range for Bigfoot and Jackalope, so Muldoon has to boost in, which is really not ideal, and if he double maneuvers, he overdraws, so he's in a kind of a tough situation here. Not a good spot. Nope. He does have some trap placement options, though, because he is in that blue zone, which spans basically the entire map. <laughs> mm-hmm. But I don't know. That's... I think I'd be weary to even lay traps right now because you already have three of them out. You only have four of them left throughout the game. And like yep. I said, if Bigfoot just avoids them most of the game and then end game just pops a bunch of them at once, that's really bad for fatigue. I wouldn't even mind seeing uh, uh, Baked Goods use one of his schemes if he has any, just to, to avoid the double maneuver, avoid having to discard. But it looks like, uh, oh, oh, and there's the call for oh, that. Oh, very nice. This is a game changer, potentially. Yep. Uh, now, a thing you can do with this card is it says place up to three traps. So if you don't want to draw, you want to use it as a pass, you can choose to place zero traps because up two means zero, one, two, or three. So he can choose to place zero traps and simply reborn all of the defeated workers, which is uh, often a play you see with Call for Backup. You can choose to put zero yeah. traps. That, that is... yeah. are, you, are you putting Lily Guy, though? Yeah, yeah, I'm putting zero. This is the first of two Call for Backups that he is playing right now. Okay. So he did choose zero traps and uh, oh, place workers. So Bigfoot is... Um, Looks like safe, at least, or I mean, Muldoon is safe for this turn. How do you feel about placing no traps in that moment? I definitely agree with it. I think you you want to reserve your traps for cutting off those, um, like those key spaces, those key connections to keep Muldoon safe. Right now, there's not really any real point because he does have Muldoon safe at the moment without mm-hmm. having to place any traps. Once again, seeing Joshua playing a little bit more defensively, trying just to, to build up that hand, to potentially draw a couple more defenses or some other strong att- attacks. And the other thing about having a, a large hand is it gives him a, a couple more options as to you know how, how he can um, go about this next portion of the battle. Yep, more options is always good. No trap. Now we're seeing both fighters locked and loaded here. <laughs> Maneuver. Nice. I like this sandwiching there. Muldoon. Uh, yep. Yep, because then oh, Jack Lophorns can't work on Muldoon. Crash of the Trees isn't getting you to Muldoon. Hoax isn't getting you to Muldoon yep. unless you kill a worker. The only thing would be if Muldoon attacks here and Bigfoot defends with a skirmish, he can actually pull Muldoon towards him, which would be brutal mm-hmm. because that opens up a double attack turn for Bigfoot. So Baked Goods has got to be careful here with what he attacks with. On defense. And there we do see the skirmish. Wow. The skirmish. Oh, but he has second oh, shot. But it's, oh, but it's a boost. That's going to be huge. If he has a boost value of three in hand, he can beat the skirmish and not get pulled out. And he does. There Look we go. That. Oh, he even attacked Jackalope, not Bigfoot. That's, that's still. I that would was, even say even better, yeah. That was huge. So you can definitely tell by what he attacked with there that he he was careful. He knew about the skirmish, and he played around it. Attack the worker. Where'd he go? Worker attack. 
And this can be very crucial because if he can get this attack off, well then, it, as long as he has a yeah. crash with the trees, he can have access to uh, uh, Muldoon as well. And there's that disengage. No defense, so Bigfoot does get to go basically anywhere on the map yet again. Green, blue, or white. So great options. Although that was a maneuver and an attack, so a worker at least is in all those zones. So Bigfoot does get double attacked here if Big Goods wants to take that opportunity. This is very true. And, and you know, having that double attack can be crucial in, in a game like this. Yep. Yeah, to John's point earlier, the goal here is going to be to run Bigfoot out of defenses. So double attacking is is definitely key to that. Yep. No trap. Yeah. yeah, Bigfoot has four wow. uh, pure attack cards. So at some point, he's going to have to dig into those versatile cards. And uh, while there is quite a bit of them, uh, it, we're going to be seeing potentially... Uh, um, yeah, those defenses run out fairly quickly, but we are seeing a retreat here from Muldoon instead. Double maneuver again. Double maneuver, okay. yeah, retreat. Okay, mm -hmm. so that evens out the deck count, which Joshua has been playing really smart with Bigfoot because you don't want to use his end of turn draw ability uh, too often, if at all, in this matchup because you know it's going to go long and you need to give yourself every advantage in fatigue that you can and i guess i don't know if we mentioned that but bigfoot's ability is that at the end of your turn if there's no opposing fighters in bigfoot zone you can just draw an extra card which is huge it's really easy and convenient draw power for when you need it but in this matchup it's almost more of a curse absolutely solid sandwich positioning once again yep yep I, l I like this defensive positioning, even though he could have gone for the, the double attack. You know, once again, you, not being able to move in and take down Muldoon, that's huge. Though it does mean that if the worker dies off here, Bigfoot's out of range of Muldoon and the last worker. So that's not ideal for baked goods. It would have been nice if he could have set up some kind of position where if Bigfoot comes in for an attack, it puts him in a double attack you know, double counter-attack position. Right. No defense. Let's see, yet another worker going down to a savagery. Ooh. How many savageries is that that we've seen? Yeah. Two or three? That's, That's three. Goodbye, right? That was all three? All three? Yes, I believe so. And both disengages. And one log, right? So there's one more, or there's two more logs left, and those are the only pure attack cards left for Bigfoot. Other than that, like you said, Tristan, he's going to have to be digging into those versatiles to start killing these workers. Yeah, he has those two larger than lives, which are the, the value six. And then he has the three momentous shifts and the one skirmish as as some other high values. Oh, and, and the hope. So he has a, a decent amount of high value cards, uh, but how he uses them is going to be huge. It's, it's going to be a, a big deal in this match. Yep. But also, Jackalope has not used any of the horns yet, and he's at four health, so we'll see. I, I bet Joshua is going to try to use a Jackalope horn soon here, and then retreat Jackalope, uh, and then he can yeah. double Jackalope horns on a following turn, and then it doesn't matter if Jackalope dies off anymore at that point, so that pulls off all three of the horns. <clears throat> but if, if Baked Goods can get to Jackalope and take him out, which uh, it do he is in the position where he can maneuver with a worker into that pink zone and get Jackalope at least for one attack. Yeah, I think you want to do that. Um, not just to avoid the Jackalope horns, which I think are coming. I, I don't know that he can take him out in one turn, but just to have Bigfoot waste a defense. Yep. And so that is why it looks like um, he placed the trap here because now Bigfoot can't get around any way to reach Muldoon because the trap will stop him. So we do see the attack on Jackalope, but it's a feint. But we see a rending shot, so it won't get to move Jackalope, but it does still deal one damage over that cancel. And here we see the horns. Yep. He gets to go through the fighters to the back of Muldoon to deal two damage. And now we're likely to see a retreat. 
and um, I like the feint from Joshua here with understanding that it's probably a rending shot that Baked Goods is throwing at him to to prevent those jackalope horns, and, and that feint would, uh, yeah, allows him to be able to keep the positioning as it is and, and get those two free hits down. Exactly, because since Jackalope was in this starting shot. one space, one if he got pushed back three spaces, he wouldn't have been able to make it to yeah. Muldoon with Jackalope horns on the first action. Yep. And now once again, the Bigfoot and the Jackalope are coming at him from both sides. You know, does he go aggressive here or are we gonna see a, a retreat? So what I would love to see here is Muldoon moving up to Jackalope and making an attack, but also the worker moving up adjacent to Bigfoot, because with all of Bigfoot's big attacks gone, Momentous Shift doesn't trigger up to a five if Bigfoot doesn't move. And so the worker could safely defend with one of their three value defenses and survive any of Bigfoot's attacks, barring the log, which he doesn't want to waste on a worker here. So it almost guarantees that the worker would be able to defend Bigfoot's attack and it would give Muldoon an attack opportunity on the Jackalope. Uh, and then I will attack. Did we just see a double maneuver? Um, No, I think just one maneuver. He started with eight cards because oh, Bigfoot right. set the oh, trap off. Oh, right. Okay. I was I was very curious. Uh, But that, yeah. That's still going to be a discard from his hand. Yeah, he better make this attack count. It's... You gotta think he's trying to go for a second shot so he can make use of those cards. Oh, but it's not. It is a rending shot. Mm. And Joshua faints. The other those things really showing off just how how crucial they are. Right. The other thing that I'm thinking about and exactly what he's doing here is he he can afford to oh. discard that remote detonation. It doesn't often get used in in this matchup and so uh, i can assume he just getting you know overdrawing taking out that remote detonation if it's not going to be used and uh, just um yeah let instead attacking with that that one and and being okay with with having eight cards in their hand one two three uh no that's too many spaces i'll just but again bigfoot uh, uh putting a bit of pressure on baked goods in regards to the card draw yeah, it's a good play at this point. Bigfoot has the health to spare um, at this point, and he knows that Baked Goods' hand is, is huge. Yep, and they're even in the deck count right now with still two traps on board and three left on deck. So that's uh, potentially five more extra cards drawn from Muldoon, so it's going to make Muldoon not even want to place any more traps. Um, but he might have to to keep Bigfoot away. So I definitely think this is going into a fatigue scenario, as I think most of these matchups do which coming back to your point tristan of discarding remote detonation although that's not likely to be used for its actual effect of popping a trap and dealing a damage to all adjacent fighters it is often used from muldoon as a simply a pass because if you use it when either a you don't have any workers on the map so it won't uh there's no zone that the workers are in to detonate a trap it'll just be a blank card activation which is a blank pass or if all the workers are in different zones than the traps are, again, it can, same thing, be used as a pass. And there's three copies of that in deck, so sometimes that can be a crucial pass. Absolutely. I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with that as well. It, and sometimes those passes uh, are huge, considering InGen has, uh, in the deck as a whole, five <sighs> passes, but so does Bigfoot. I, we're, we're looking at uh, very equal amounts of passes overall. And so if it does go to fatigue, Every small decision is is going to matter. Yep. And not only the jackalope horns are they too auto damage, but they are passes themselves, which is just a massive advantage for Bigfoot when it comes to any fatigue scenarios. Okay. Uh, and then I'll attack Bigfoot with the work. I do like this play here, uh, putting Muldoon as far away as possible from the jackalope uh, to negate any jackalope horns, and then just. Uh, throwing the worker at Bigfoot to to you know keep that hand card down, and we do see the second shot here as well. I like the second shot because it makes a use at least a little bit out of that extra card in hand that he would have overdrawn and had to discard. Right. So he yeah. Does he, was get a damage. To, he was gonna have to get rid of the card anyway, so now at least he gets some damage from it. 
Yep. Yeah. So Bigfoot gets to maneuver up. This is it has to be a log right here. Absolutely. I I think we if if you're Muldoon the Ingen player, you hit you come with a big defense if you've got it. Yep. You have to at this point. If you take four, if you faint a log here and take four, simply the two jackalope horns kill you. And there we go. Good four defense. Yep. Also sets Muldoon and his last worker up for uh, the double counterattack, potentially. And how many hoaxes have we seen used? Um, five, uh, at least two, if not all three. Okay, that could be huge, because hoax is the best card for getting in on Muldoon, as we just saw there. And if there's no more hoaxes, Muldoon can pretty safely double attack Bigfoot, because he's going to have to start just using his cancels. And uh, Skirmish only moves if you win the combat. So Muldoon may be able to, like, place a trap down adjacent to Bigfoot and hit with they should all be destroyed, which means Skirmish mm. doesn't allow movement because it didn't win from the five attack. Okay. Oh, but it looks like he is going to double attack Jackalope here. I it looks like we're seeing a, an attack against yeah. Jackalope. So if he does have a hoax or a skirmish here, that that could maybe prevent that double attack. But like you said, yep. And if it's an all, uh, you know, they should all be destroyed. That's gonna be huge. Or a shooter. I, I think he has one skirmish left. Oh, oh that was gonna be the that was good. Then. There good, we go. Good defense from Joshua, but good attack from Baked Goods as well. Still getting at least one damage through on that imagination. And that's that's where those cancels, those extra cancels that Bigfoot has come in handy. You still got one faint and one imagination left. One faint, one imagination. Yep. So. Yep. Maneuver. Yeah, I, I was gonna say baked goods kind of has to maneuver here to be safe. Uh, Although he's not safe from jackalope horns, regardless of where he goes. Yeah. Go ahead. So he's choosing to stay in place. A bold move. He knows That's that Jackalope bold. can't attack with anything higher than a three because the momentous shift won't trigger up to a five at this point unless Jackalope moves on to the trap and takes a damage. Or if the Jackalope uh, uses the Jackalope horns, moves through Muldoon and then with the momentous. That would be a play, yeah. That'd be a pretty good one. Because I've... Muldoon has how many fours left? Only two, maybe? Well, he's got two, two leap aways. And that's yeah, it. Taking, he has two leap aways, exactly. Oh, it looks like Baked Goods is going to retreat and force Joshua to have the horns if he wants to reach Muldoon. Sure. But I wouldn't be surprised to see Jackalope oh, simply maneuver up and kill that worker with a momentous shift either. Because then Baked Goods has to have that second call for backup, like now, or else he's in big trouble. And I'll never again. Joshua no pushing attack from yeah, Jack. Very interesting. Just digging for those horns. Yep, you see the Jackalope uh, being placed uh, in and Bigfoot in, in zones where they cannot be hit twice in a row. Uh, and okay. that's, that's going to be huge. Yeah, just going through that deck, getting the damage he needs. Ability? Time is on Joshua's side at this uh, point. No. So Tristan, baked goods, he's at six cards in hand. Joshua's at six cards in hand. He's got to maneuver and attack, right? I mean, right. I, I don't think you're going to maneuver yeah. twice here and risk. No, <laughs> no way. <laughs> no, it, it's, it's got to be an, a maneuver and an attack. Oh, okay. Nice. Oh, we'll so see is a remote detonation. Oh, interesting. Getting that uh, extra damage off. That's going to be huge. That's fair. That is good. Yeah. Then he gets the card draw too. Yeah. So yeah, that free damage. That means Jackalope is only at one health, and he still has two of the horns that he needs to play. Uh, and so, if Baked Goods can get just one more health down, whether it's through that last remote detonation, 
or through an attack that's going to be that that could be a huge part um but we are getting close to the 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 end game here and so yeah baked goods needs to <laughs> he he needs to to keep that pressure on and, and to to play very wisely with his positioning and everything It looks like he's trying to position so Jackalup Horns can't hit him twice. Okay. Yeah. Which he has I think successfully he, done. No, because I think he can come in from the bottom right here. One, two, three, four, five. Oh, yep, there's, wow. There's the the one Jackalope. Does he have another? Or is are we going to see an attack, maybe a momentous shift? He still has all three of them. Well, with one health, he might retreat if he doesn't have the other horns. It's very true. And it looks like we are seeing a retreat as well. But that does give Muldoon an opportunity if he can kill the Jackalope. He does negate one of those horns. And with only one more log left, Bigfoot's going to have to find that two damage somehow. The hope now is that Baked Good realizes that those two damage from the jackalope horns are, are crucial because i think there's the tendency now to be like well he's 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 gone through two of them he's only got one left let me refocus my efforts elsewhere and that would be a huge mistake yep though baked goods does have three traps on board if he wants to guarantee a kill on jackalope he has to place down that last trap adjacent to jackalope and then maneuver and attack Jackalope with they should all be destroyed, which would be his last big four attack that is not being used on Bigfoot just to guarantee the one damage against Jackalope. And that's a pretty telegraphed play, so Joshua doesn't even have to waste a defense at that point. It will guarantee the kill on the Jackalope, but it's a very risky play with four traps on board when he only has six cards in deck and four health and still needs to get through Bigfoot's 11. Yeah. And that would be his last trap. Yep. So it's a very telegraphed and risky play, but I don't know. It's hard to make the call of whether or not that needs to be done. And this is where experience in this matchup and just being really good at high pressure, like late game scenarios really pays off because I feel like when both players play well, these matchups always go come down to things like this. There. Interesting. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting placement. Then I'll maneuver. Maybe his plan is to not attack Jackalope anymore and make it so if he wants to use the horns, Jackalope has to. He can't use them. He has to get through a trap and will just die off. And I'll oh, but we do see the worker Jackalope. moving right up next to Jackalope. So I think oh. this this would be the attack right here to, to try and get rid of Jackalope. It could be a rending shot because if he defends with anything other than a cancel, rending shot will push Jackalope through into the trap. Well, not through, but onto a trap and kill him. If Very ever true. there was a time to use regroup as a bait, this is it. That's true because we haven't seen any regroups come out from baked goods other than the one, have we? The yeah, one he's got two game, left. The one at the very beginning. Yeah, yeah he's still sitting on two. It's so risky, but it would be such a big payoff if he does bait with a regroup here. Oh, there yes. Oh, he did. <laughs> wow. He did it. Good stuff. You got me. What a yeah. what a call right there with the with the skirmish. John, what's your signature saying? You love to you see it. You love to see it right there. Although, Absolutely. if you're baked goods, you would have been happier with a cancel coming out because then you don't have to draw. So it is uh, yeah. not completely ideal, yeah. but it does waste a skirmish, which is, is that the last four value defense? That was the last skirmish. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that was the last skirmish. He still has a folks, if I'm correct. Oh, that could be deadly. And then he just gave up a faint, right? Yeah. Make goods. Yeah. With three momentous shifts left, is that correct? That seems a little mm. risky. Yeah, no There's momentous shifts three. have been played. Though again, three momentous shifts. But again, you can't afford to even Just use a faint face. because when Bigfoot's attacking you, if it's a log, you're dead. You can't afford to use faints anymore. So unless you're going to attack with them, which isn't bad if they're still hoax. Take the damage. Um, 
Yeah, we're seeing uh, Joshua. He's just going to play the fatigue and game here, and I think that's going to close out the game. Yep. All in the new for again. That's... One. Joshua has so many avenues of of being able to win, especially with that last being able to call out the the regroup from Baked Goods. That that was okay. such a crucial moment. I think if Baked Goods had gotten away with it, there was uh, a spark of of a comeback here. But uh, okay, because of that good read that. from Josh, no. <laughs> the this is uh, this is looking uh, to be um, Bigfoot's game to lose. Yep, I agree. Well, Dune is in a very tough situation. I would be a bit surprised if he pulls it out, but we've seen crazier things. Mm, yep. In the last tourney with, uh, you know, Sinbad beating Bigfoot against all odds. <laughs> right. What a match that was. Yep. Absolutely. And that's the reason why Unmatch is just such a great game. Even if the odds are against you, anything can happen. Uh, and, and it really makes for exciting, tense games with uh, just amazing, amazing stories that come out of it. Yep. Oh, another thing we never mentioned, I don't think, is Joshua is from Singapore. So he's all the way across the world. So for him right now, it's past midnight. Ooh. So it's really late for him. So even for, uh, if nothing else, he wants to end this game as a 2-0 so he can get some sleep. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah, I told you, man. That's what's keeping him awake, that that desire yep. for revenge right now. It's fueling yep. him. Yep. Who, needs, who needs sleep? He'll live <laughs> off of that. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Call for backup. Now, there we, go. we see call for backup, but we see the worker on the trap, and I don't like that i don't think baked goods is thinking about that fact we talked earlier how bigfoot can use crashing okay. through the trees or things yeah. like hoax to move through and keep popping traps so if he has a crashing if he has two crashing through the trees right now he gets to trigger both traps and that brings muldoon to zero cards in deck and he's gonna have to make a maneuver at least once and it'll just be game over at that point Yep. It's definitely possible Baked Goods doesn't know because it's a it's a fringe ruling, I feel like. And if you're not familiar with Muldoon and you're not familiar with this ba this uh, matchup, that's going to hurt. Yes. Yes. Oh, but Joshua just discarded Crashing Through the Trees to boost. Interesting. Very interesting. Not at all what we were expecting. And no. But there's the last horn, so now Jackalope can die happy knowing he did his job. Yep. And now there's no incentive for InGen to to take out the Jackalope, and Joshua can use that either as a positioning tool or just to you know pop one extra trap, take that damage, and and uh, um, you know be be the martyr in this case and and force to force the the draw. Yep. Interesting that he used Crash of the Trees. I'm assuming to avoid card draw but then still did his his effect for card yeah. draw at the end yeah very interesting mm. i don't know if it matters i think he's got it the game at this point because big yes. is backed into a corner the traps are so much more of a liability than anything else right now and he only needs to get two fatigue damage or one you know one draw in fatigue to kill muldoon he doesn't even have to get to him for that last log anymore well, I wonder if if Baked Goods is intentionally putting people on those traps so that there's less of a chance that they can be sprung. I mean, now with the the crash through the trees, the one of them uh, discarded, uh, you know, then then through a normal maneuver or through uh, a usual, uh, um, yeah, just a usual movement ability, it, it does allow for him to possibly negate any traps being sprung and, and to keep the game running just a little bit longer. That's true. And maybe Joshua draw, drew with his ability because he realized he should have kept crashing through the trees. And now maybe he's looking for that other one quickly so he can just guarantee to seal out the game before there's any chance of baked goods coming back. No, I discarded one. Baked goods was just confirming too about crashing through the trees, I believe. Hmm. So he, he's, he knows about it. So here he's going to play around it. But a hoax will still do it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Then 
at this point, knowing that, you might as well keep the in-gen workers off and, and just try and get as many zones. Although, it, at this, like we've said, I, I think it's a little too late. I, I don't see any reason why Bigfoot shouldn't take this out at this point. I agree. I believe we're going through the motions here, but you never know if people mess up. Absolutely. Or maybe all of the bottom three cards that Josh had were his three momentous shifts that he has his defense. So maybe he was just trying to guarantee at least to get one of them. So he survives this last attack mm. to, yep. to guarantee close out the game. Because if he has crashing through the trees and he uses it right here to go behind the worker and pop that first trap and then maneuver and boost into that second trap, it's game over. Yep. That's an undefending rending shot. I defended. True, but again, <laughs> but it, I, I mean, think I don't think it matters. matters. No, yeah. no matter where you place Bigfoot, yeah. he could even just take a maneuver and crash the trees. Uh, it's <laughs> it's going to be, it, it, I think, impossible for at this point unless there is a a major mistake made here. Yep. Uh, he knows he's backed into a corner. He's thinking real hard about any <laughs> any possible chance that he can still no, take I, this game. So that does put him out of five space range oh, of both yeah. traps. So Josh has to maneuver Discard boost, which oh he discards the crashing and through the trees. Traps. Yep, and those are both of the traps popped here, and that's going to be game over. There it is. Wait, how did he pop oh. both traps? Oh, well, jackalope. Jack jack well. Jackalope. Jack yep. Sacrificing him and <laughs> yeah. and was, was dealing the damage out. necessary. Wow, what a game. That was a really twice. strong finish, yeah. moving them both onto the traps to kill them off. Yep, that's usually how it goes in this matchup when it's played well. And uh, I think yeah, this map actually worked against that. Muldoon because there's so many different uh, yeah. avenues that Bigfoot can take to swing around and still reach him despite all the traps yeah. and workers. Because he has yeah. those movement effects like Crash Through the Trees and Hoax that let him move through workers, he only really has to yeah, avoid traps, and there's just so many different ways yeah, to loop I, around. I, I, I didn't have yeah. And with all of those versatiles in hand, he, he had everything he needed to, you know, stay high on the, the defense side, and um, yeah, he, he was in a really good position at that point. Yeah, so there you have it, guys. That is going to be the result of the first semi-final match of Summer of Legends. Joshua taking it 2-0 over Baked Goods. So sad to see him go. You know, somebody's got to lose in the end, unfortunately. But it's been great competition throughout with the whole tournament and the whole top eight and everybody. So it's just been an incredible time. And everyone's been playing great and putting on such a show. Uh, I really wish we would have seen a game three there, but that's okay. It lets Joshua get to bed a little early, and he can he can rest easy knowing he's made it to the finals. And it gives him a little bit of symmetry too. He lost 0-2 to Baked Goods, and then he came back and he won 2-0. Yep, he's got to feel great about that that uh, the mirror there. <laughs> yeah, yep. I, I think so. That redemption story playing throughout it, just being able to take those games, it is. Crucial, and I think that's that might also play into going into the finals. Now that he has that, you know, two zero win streak for this match, you know, he's he's hot on his heels for uh, um, for the, the whole to thing. get the win. Yeah, right? and it's going to be really interesting because now we know the finals are either going to be me versus Joshua, which would be battle of the tos, or it's going to end up being Sojourn versus Joshua, which is battle of Singapore. So. Uh, we got quite a final set up, but uh, I'm playing my match tonight at 5 p.m. Central, so we'll see what happens there. But either way, it's slated to be an awesome final match, which is also going to be a best of five instead of a best of three. So that means four fighter picks instead of three and one band still, which means there's going to be more blind picks of matchups. So it's a little less predictable. So you're going to have to show your experience with a diverse cast of fighters and your ability to adapt to different matchups that you might not be as familiar with. 
Yep. I was going to say, and I think today, you know, Joshua demonstrated um, that he's more than comfortable being able to do that because he hasn't played Bigfoot, came in, and he beat him uh, with Bigfoot, and he played against Beowulf today. I, I think Josh has demonstrated he's more than comfortable coming in tomorrow, diverse matchups, and showing what he's got to show. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Josh was a solid player. He and I wouldn't be surprised to see if he had uh, a surprise or two up his sleeve to to bring into the finals as well. Like we've seen him consistently playing certain characters over the over the tournament, but like to you know you never know with with uh, any match whether there's another uh, sneaker pick where where the he picks a fighter and just comes up out of nowhere and and you know there's still room for new strategies to be to be being seen mm -hmm. absolutely and, and i know when me and joshua play we he's my number one practice partner and when we play which is pretty often we're always doing just random different matchups that we think could come up in tourney or that we're curious about and want to see how it goes so we we, have, we do have a lot of practice with different fighters so i think that's mm -hmm. definitely going to come in handy for him in the finals and it'll be interesting if i actually make it uh because we both know each other so well so that would be uh, a little bit concerning because we discuss all of our secret strategies with each other. But yeah, he, he played this one really well. It was a decisive win. Uh, the Beowulf game was a little more back and forth than this Muldoon one, but I think it was yep. just baked goods. Uh, a little bit of inexperience with Muldoon coming through and Joshua just playing a solid game throughout. So we are going to get uh, the players on for an interview here in just a second. So. We'll start off getting baked goods on, and then we'll hear a word from Joshua after that. So stay tuned, guys, for the interviews coming up. All right, guys, here we have Baked Goods joining us for an interview. Um, unfortunately, off of a loss, but Baked Goods, thanks for joining us. And um, to start, I want to say thanks for playing. You did an awesome job throughout the whole tournament. You were one of the undefeateds going into the end of Swiss. You played a joke match, basically, with Sojourn. And uh, that was fun to see you pull out Spike. And... Um, you know, then you made the top four, and uh, unfortunately, Joshua beat you. But what was your thoughts going into the match, having previously 2-0'd him earlier in Swiss? Uh, I So I know Josh loves playing Dracula, and I don't like playing against Dracula. So I um, that Beowulf pick for me was specifically so that Josh did not pick Dracula. Okay. Um, and I guess I was... <laughs> I, uh, I kind of, I won the die roll to pick leader or follower. Okay. And I wish Josh had, because <laughs> it's so much easier when you don't have to make the decision and someone That's else true. makes it for you. But um, yeah, so I guess I picked leader, um, pick Sherlock first, because that's just the pretty standard thing to pick first. Sure. Um, he picked Bigfoot. So I picked Beowulf because I wanted to dissuade him from picking Dracula. Okay. Uh, and Beowulf's pretty good against Bigfoot, so. Sure. Yeah. And that's where that's where it kind of all went uh, weird, I guess, because he picked Robin Hood and then there's a lot of thinking on those last picks for both of us. Yeah, because the Robin Hood pick kind of dissuades you from going Muldoon mm -hmm. in a way. And uh, obviously yeah. with him having Bigfoot, that's probably somebody you'd want to take. So I was surprised to not see the thief come out in this match. Yeah, I usually I like stealing people's main players i guess right um, I, th I thought about taking little red third because i know josh also likes playing her mm -hmm. um but in my head i was like oh then he could pick sinbad third and have a, a pretty good matchup against both beowulf and muldoon yeah and when when bigfoot is on the other person's lineup and i have sinbad i guess even though i'm like trying to counter Bigfoot, it felt bad in my head to have to ban Sinbad, so I don't know. That probably would have been a better, because as you can tell, I'm not that experienced with Muldoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we did talk about that a little bit, how you've played, what, 13 out of, like, the 19 fighters throughout Swiss and the top four, or the top eight, I should say, and uh, so these were two new fighters, I believe, that you hadn't played previously mm -hmm. in the tourney, is that correct? Yes. 
Wow. So, I mean, you really have shown that you're, you know, competent with a wide variety of fighters, but unfortunately... I don't, I don't know if that's the right word. But <laughs> competent, maybe not experienced or, or good, but <laughs> competent uh -huh. at least. So, but yeah, that was interesting. Um, yeah, I was just, why didn't you pick Dracula? Was it because he went with Bigfoot? Yeah, that was a matchup I felt a little shaky about, um, just because you can't pull the... Uh, it's just your imaginations mm -hmm. with hitting. Um, but sometimes uh, you get lucky. Uh, like in your match versus Zoe, I think an ambush yeah, brought out. Yeah, yesterday. An imagination. Yep, yeah. Yep, and then I was so. stuck. I couldn't attack anymore because he'd pull mm -hmm. out my feint and kill me with beast form. Um, yeah. But also, it, like, if you would have taken Dracula, you didn't mm -hmm. have Beowulf to worry about as a counter pick from Joshua. So I thought mm -hmm. that would have been interesting if you did go with Drac, and I don't know what he would have gone with afterwards because other than beowulf there's not a lot of really hard counters to dracula mm -hmm. so i just thought that was interesting i thought we were going to see another uh another thief coming out but not not this time <laughs> that's okay maybe next time maybe next time yeah well congrats on mm -hmm. top four regardless um how about you john i'm, I'm sure you have that. some questions right got anything you want to yeah. ask what okay so what was your philosophy heading into this because you'd already beaten him 2-0 mm -hmm. you laid the smack down on him round four so you had to know that joshua was coming in determined for revenge how did that influence you know how you sought to play the game and how you prepped for it uh honestly i think that 2-0 is not indicative of <laughs> the skill difference between me and josh uh, sure i think i got very lucky in our previous match because in game two i think i won a lot of 50 50s um as dracula to beat his little red so i knew uh just because i beat him 2-0 once definitely was going to be much harder this time uh and he probably was a little bit more motivated because uh, he didn't want to lose to me twice i'm assuming but <laughs> yeah good point yeah we saw we saw the thief in your last match you took dracula mm -hmm. from him um, and then this time I saw you took Sherlock because he's, he's picked Sherlock 80% of the time. Yeah. So I, I did note that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, well. that factored into my wanting to be the leader uh, just because Sherlock is almost an insta ban at this point and just taking him so that I know Josh is going to ban him pretty much um, was also something that I had in mind. So playing cool. off of that point, I've noticed Josh has targeted Medusa quite a lot throughout the tournament as well, and gone with a lineup of, let's say, Dracula or Robin Hood or Little Red to counter Medusa. And so you taking Sherlock, that actually did play a role because it made him pick Medusa instead of leaving Medusa for you, and that would have left his ban a little more open. He would have more flexibility with his ban against you if you had Medusa in your lineup because he might feel comfortable countering her. Mm -hmm. So we did see a little bit of the thief come into play, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if you heard about or saw any of my uh, quarterfinal match last night, but I played Medusa against Hamid Epin, and I lost to Little Red, which was Ooh. a really good matchup for Medusa. Mm -hmm. And then I barely beat Dracula, so I really did not feel comfortable playing Medusa. <laughs> okay. At all, which is why I did not pick her today. Yeah, so I mean, maybe it was smart that you did go with leader and avoided that situation. Not yeah. a bad call at all. Yeah, I definitely did not want him getting both Sherlock and Medusa because that poses a lot of trouble. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that, that's a really hard lineup to beat. You want to avoid that at all costs if you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you feel about the Beowulf game? That one, we were loving that one. It was so back and forth the whole time. We kept being like, oh, my gosh, like Josh got such a or you got such a good start because you took the undefended regroup and we're like, oh, he's in a good position to fatigue him out and win this game. And then it swung back around. We're like, oh, no, Josh is running him out of defense, got a couple of good attacks in. And then it kept flipping back and forth. And it was just so exciting. Yes. Uh, I think my biggest mistake that game there was one turn around the mid game where he attacked me twice with two regroups and I spent a war King and a Grendel on oh. that. And I think that, that really hurt me. That <laughs> yeah. was brutal. I remember that turn specifically. 
Yeah, and there was a moment near the end where you you went in to attack him and you pulled off your heirloom, I believe, but it also he defended with the defenders of Sherwood and he popped that outlaw behind you and he had you pinned. And I feel like maybe if you would have just played safer and backed off like double maneuver and made him come to you, you might have been able mm -hmm. to fatigue him because then you wouldn't have been trapped in that pin scenario for him to run you out of your last defenses. Yes. <laughs> but uh, you, you saw the opportunity. You probably were like, oh, well, this might be my only shot to pull that off. Mm -hmm. Let's take it now. My thinking was that maybe you wait until fatigue so that the outlaws auto die, you know, when they maneuver. Mm -hmm. So then you mm -hmm. can get to Robin Hood in fatigue as the finishing blow. Yes. Almost as soon as I played the card down to attack, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. This is about to happen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially with so little cards left in deck, you know the available options, and you can almost just, it's almost just like a, a script at that point, you know? So you knew it was yeah. coming, and yeah, mm -hmm. that that sucks. That moment of regret, like, oh man, I messed up. Yeah. Although it was still, it was just so close, because even at the end there, once you attacked and you killed that outlaw with the Fatal Struggle, if you would have drawn Golden Drinking Horn, you could have played it and used the heal and the move to get out of range, and then you'd be at six health. So even though he can maneuver and attack you, it bring you down to one it wouldn't kill you and then he's at zero cards in deck and i think maybe maybe if you could have just maneuvered and attacked him for lethal there or maybe a double maneuver i don't really remember but it would have given you a chance but you had to draw the drinking horn off the fatal struggle yeah and i don't think i did no you didn't because then you just maneuvered and then that was it he came and attacked mm -hmm. you with the wily fighting to finish it but man what yeah. a game that was that was a blast to watch Mm -hmm. And the Muldoon one a little bit more one-sided, I guess, because it's a really, really difficult matchup to navigate on both ends. Mm -hmm. And if there's any inexperience in that matchup specifically, I think it really shows. I'm glad that Prospero isn't on this commentary team because I'm assuming he would have just been ripping my, <laughs> my decisions <laughs> the whole game. Um, I guess I played, I, I played on Marmorial because I had practice that matchup uh, about a week ago and i felt like pretty comfortable playing on that map as muldoon mm -hmm. um but obviously i need a little bit more practice as was that against rod it was yeah it was okay <laughs> interesting <laughs> yeah yeah i think that map um actually it's it's a decent one but i don't think it's the best because there's a lot of different ways bigfoot can get around to yeah. still reach Muldoon because he's got those move through people effects like hoax and crashing through the trees. So you mm -hmm. can't rely on that alone. You need to use your traps and there's just too many kind of loops around that Bigfoot can get around the traps. Yeah. But, yeah. It's a tough matchup regardless uh, on, on both sides. Yeah. I thought about picking Yukon for the map, but mm -hmm. just cause I wasn't mm -hmm. really experienced with Muldoon on Yukon. I didn't feel comfortable picking it. So sure. Yeah. And you got to play to your experience levels at this point because if you go into like a, a matchup blind, so to speak, you know, any little mistake, it costs you the match. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's not a bad decision to go with something you're more comfortable with. But yeah. unfortunately, it just didn't work out in the end. Mm -hmm. Well fought either yeah. way, though. Yeah, Josh is a great player. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had a ton of fun this match. Yeah, it was great to see you guys like laughing and, you know, we could see, you couldn't hurt, hear you that well, but we saw you guys laughing and having a good time. So that's always good to see, especially in such a high pressure situation. Yeah, I love I love talking back and forth with my opponent just because it makes it a little bit more interesting to play. And yeah, I'm sure just being more loose and open with your opponent, I think, is just more fun for me to play than sitting in silence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can see that. Definitely. So, uh, Tristan, do you have any specific questions you want to pose out there? Uh, one one question actually going into game two that i had thought of is uh what was your kind of mindset of picking in gen over beowulf uh going to the the second game i figured that because i lost game one i would have map choice for game two and i figured that map choice would probably help in gen more than it would help beowulf mm. uh, especially because uh beowulf and wiggy are both melee fighters and uh uh bigfoot and the jackalope are both melee as well so the map i don't think really matters that much in that matchup so i wanted uh in gen to have a 
more favorable match because he's ranged, which gives him a little bit of an advantage over Bigfoot. Okay, I definitely agree with that. And also, especially because Baskerville was banned, you couldn't mm -hmm. pick Beowulf and go to Baskerville, which I think is his best shot against Bigfoot. So with that off the mm -hmm. table already and you knowing that, I, I, I can see why you picked Muldoon. And especially my thought was that, well, you have a favorable matchup here, uh, at least slightly. And if you can take it to a game three, it's more of a high pressure situation that maybe there's more room for Josh to make mistakes in the Bigfoot versus Beowulf matchup if it makes it to that point. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, it didn't work out. But you st again, great match overall. Super entertaining and glad to have you on here. Um, anybody watching too, Baked Goods has an awesome YouTube channel with uh, a ton of awesome strategy guide videos. He's working on making one for every character and he's got a, a good handful of them out already. And uh, especially his tournament matches too, he's been posting on there. So those are good learning tools if you wanna catch up and see some real competitive play in action. And uh, it's just an awesome channel overall and he's a really fun guy and it's fun to watch. So definitely go check out his YouTube channel. It's just called Baked Goods. And uh, we will link it in the Twitch chat there. So if you guys want to go check that out, make sure you like it, subscribe, you know, all that good stuff. And uh, I'm sure he would appreciate that. So yes, thank you very much for yeah. the plug, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. But uh, with that stuff said, um, is there any any closing thoughts you want to say before we sign off here? Anything for you, John? Any other questions that you have for him? Nothing for me. Okay, Tristan. Wait, nope. his name is John and not Tommy? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. I know. There's two Johns? Mind blown, <laughs> huh? <laughs> oh, are you telling me that Twister's real name isn't Twister? <laughs> <laughs> that one might be. <laughs> nah. Yep. It, it was funny because when we played our match, I played against Tommy Elliott in the, in the Swiss rounds, and it was Battle of the Johns. So that was funny. <laughs> but less less funny for me who got my butt kicked but, yeah, yeah. It was, it was good time. yeah it was a good time so all right well uh baked goods uh, any closing thoughts anything else you want to say before we sign off yes uh sherlock is not big three spike is <laughs> that is some words of wisdom right there everybody take note <laughs> <laughs> that's why i'm not going to the finals <laughs> <laughs> good point <laughs> <laughs> all right well thanks a lot for coming on for the interview um well oh, yeah. played throughout the tournament congrats on your top four and i hope to have you back in the next one mm -hmm. all Hopefully, right man yep. i'll be next year you'll be interviewing me for the finals for the finals there you go good goal <laughs> there you go. love it uh -huh. all right man. Oh, yeah. thank you guys so much <laughs> no problem take care yep and we'll get joshua on here for an interview next guys so stick around we're getting him in right now Hey, Joshua, can you hear us? Yes. All right. How you doing? <laughs> Congrats on the big win. You got a 2-0 victory, and you are headed to the finals. So how are yeah. you feeling after that win? I'm just I, – I haven't quite absorbed it yet. Sure. I think the first, the first match is the one that – the first game was a lot closer. The second one, it doesn't look as close, but – I had just come off a loss against Dr. Angelicus Calvin in the quarterfinals. He schooled me. I couldn't touch Muldoon after Jackalope died. Sure. And yeah, I'm just glad the pig bands were close. I think both of us stood a chance. And yeah. Yeah. I hope the games are entertaining. Yeah, well, that first game, man, that was an incredible back and forth battle with Beowulf and Robin. We kept flipping back and forth between who we thought was going to win that one. It was just so close. And uh, how are you feeling off of that first opening move when you hit him with the regroup and he didn't defend? Not <laughs> great. I, I right. know with Robin's draw, you, you want to bait out something. I wanted to faint. Yeah, right. Because, because it was you, the once, out the yeah, yeah it was the outlaw. Because otherwise, I want regroups for baiting out Grendel with Robin Hood, but that worked out my way later on. It did, yeah. That turn where you had the double attack with regroups into the War King and the Grendel that was a big turning point, I think, in the match. And um, 
so it, it was interesting though to see you attacking with the regroups rather than um trying to not like maybe discard them for boost so that you wouldn't draw because after that disarming shot that drew you four cards uh, uh, yes. you had to be a pretty funny. concerned about fatigue at that point what were you thinking i i wasn't thinking when i played that card <laughs> i wanted to bait out a skirmish sure and i i think Theo had two rage at that point. I couldn't attack him. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to take four to the face. Sure. So, plus, I mean, in a matchup like Robin, Theo, and Sherwood, Robin has good zone coverage. Um, Sherwood is the only map where there's no space that is adjacent to another zone without being... Like, they're all shared zones. Right at the, the edges, but it's also very corridor-like. So you can see Bay really positioned Wiglaf well. I had to discard a lot of cards to boost. Yep. I ended up using Faints a lot because it's garbage you can say them. Yeah, you can't really take that risk, I guess. So once I got that disarming shot in, I realized I'd committed. I am going full aggro. There's basically no way Robin wins this in fatigue anyway. He has yep. no passes whatsoever and all draw. Yep. So I just went for it. I had to I had to use Defenders of Sherwood to the maximum twice, I think. Mm -hmm. And get out his feints, use ambush, hope the moment he goes out of defenses, I think I can just land a killing blow. Yeah, that last ambush hitting his war king was huge. Hmm. It, it was. Yeah. That saved an attack that would have saved him a lot of damage. Right. But like you said, you you were going full aggression at that point. So I think it is smart of you to use those other regroups that you used later on um, to bait out those two defenses. Because like you said, there's no going back. So, you know, well played being able to recognize the situation and co fully commit to it. And it, it worked out in the end. You got the win. So that was a, that was a really good one. And uh, John, do you have any any questions you want to pose? Yeah, so I wanted to ask if there was even a thought in your mind about not banning Sherlock. Just because he's your main, you're so oh, infinitely no. familiar with him. I, I was wondering if you thought, like, well, I know this character pretty well, and maybe I could take him down and really surprise Baked. I could. The, there are fighters that can beat Sherlock. He's not untouchable as a Sherlock fan. I know that. I know the fighters that are good into him, but I also know that's relative. It Being good into a big three might be under 50%. That's still the best you could do. And there are just so many other fighters that are better to target. Mm -hmm. So there, it's not a viable strategy at this point. So I just decided to pick a good fighter, wait and see what he picked. I heard the interview actually I didn't pick Medusa second. I picked Medusa last this follower. It was oh, wow. after I knew those Beowulf and in general. Interesting. So so Baked Goods really just didn't feel comfortable playing Medusa after his match yesterday. That played a big role then. Yeah, I think I can understand how, how that felt. After I lost to him, I think I switched away from Red and Robin for a bit. Mm -hmm. So... It, it can definitely impact how you are, especially in the Swiss, you have a whole week to recover. Now, the quarterfinal matches were played yesterday or the day before. There is no time to recover. Right. The action just keeps that makes on sense. coming. Yeah. How, how do you like, You may not about... be psychologically tired, but it's just there is no time to get a casual game in to get your confidence back by just winning. Yeah. How do you feel, Josh, about uh, coming in and 2 owing Baked Goods after your last match where he O2 to you? Does that does that feel great? I'm glad I, I played well. I again, like you said, those matches, even these matches, are a lot closer than the the final score indicates. And I think at this level, it's the fine margins. Whether it's a two or two one. Sometimes a 2-1 can be more of a wipeout than a 2-0. That's so, a good point. 
Yeah. Yeah, it really depends on the lineups after the picks and bans. So, Tristan, do you have any questions you want to throw out there? Uh, none that I I have in my uh, so far. None that's in my mind. Okay. Uh, yeah, but I, again, congratulations on the win. Like it's it. Those were exciting games. I. And I, I loved how, especially that second game, you seemed to be really in control of that matchup. You you kind of had the uh, a good idea of the pacing, and you you set the tone for the second match, kind of correctly um, calling out the the reads from uh, Big Goods in Gen. I guess uh, going into the the second matchup, you, like you you have that win condition of you know getting enough damage in. You know what was your mindset yeah. in, in that in, in that well, situation? Like like I said, the, the quarterfinal match where I lost Bigfoot played a big role. I had done everything wrong in that matchup. So basically, mm -hmm. my game plan was don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, I thought mean, John's quarterfinal win with Bigfoot. So that also helped realizing I can't afford to draw with my ability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I could have been of some assistance there. <laughs> watching yeah. my misfortune a little bit there but um so we have an awesome finals coming up i mean are you gonna stay on your win streak i know john had mentioned that up until you faced fake goods in the swiss you were undefeated in games let alone matches and uh now that you've 2 0 baked yeah. goods are you ready to 3-0 the finals i i think it's <laughs> gonna be a slug fest there's so many the f the best of five meta is untested mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and with the blind picks you're pretty much hoping that you have a good map possibility of matchups across the board and just hope you get one that goes in your favor yeah yeah it, like you said it really is untested so we're gonna see what happens uh, but you know it's gonna end up either being me and you battle of the to's or you and soldier in battle of singapore i assure so. you it's not rigged <laughs> <laughs> it sounds pretty rigged either way to me <laughs> but yeah that'll be exciting either way uh, really looking forward to it so again congrats on the win and yeah, uh thanks. no problem i mean is there just any closing thoughts you want to put out there before we sign off i'm just really glad this tournament has really surpassed my expectations after the first one. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we started the first one, we were, I was happy with getting 16 people. Right. We got double that. When we started this one, I was worried maybe the novelties worn off. Maybe we will get under 36 people, but we doubled. And it's just been, um, really incredible people have been saying they really enjoyed it mm -hmm. even when you're not in contention for top eight they still stayed on which is something the swiss you can sometimes drop out once you're not in contention but people stayed for the community for the matches and that's really why we started this in the first place yep it also feels really strange to be on this end of the commentary <laughs> I, I i commentated in the finals now i'm the player yeah yeah, it, uh, it's a pretty weird feeling, I'm sure. But you will be back in your commentator role later on for my match, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I'm so glad I booked that because I ruined my commentator <laughs> for the final. audition for the finals. <laughs> That's okay. It's a worthy sacrifice. <laughs> a noble yeah, sacrifice, sure. if you want to say. <laughs> yeah. So... Yeah, it, this tournament really has turned out fantastic. Um, you know, thanks for organizing it with me, and uh, I, I can yeah, do it. and Gary. <laughs> yeah, and Gary, too, who, uh, again, he's more in the background, but you guys help out a lot, so I really appreciate that, and I'm glad it, it has all turned out the way it has. And uh, next time, I mean, we'll be looking to push uh, 128 rather than 64. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we will get that many or be able to handle that many, but definitely hoping to accommodate or be prepared yeah yeah we'll see what happens but all right john uh tristan any closing thoughts anything else you want to throw out there yeah i just wanted to congratulate you josh on going to the finals yeah, thanks. I didn't chance to do that earlier that's super exciting yeah. and and we'll talk later because we're gonna do the yeah. commentating together see you soon yeah you bet <laughs> all right tristan yep best of luck joshua i i yeah, thank the, you yeah those, for some really great games in the finals and uh yeah all the best looking forward to it yeah 
All right, thanks. guys. All right, Joshua, thanks for joining us, and good luck in the finals, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Yep. And there you have it, guys. That is the first semifinal match um, of the Summer of Legends tournament. And again, thank you to Restoration for sponsoring this. Um, thank you to all the players who participated. Um, thank you to every one of you watching. You know, without the viewership, this wouldn't be what it is. And uh, a huge shout out and thanks to Darth Kali and Poindexter G. They were streaming other people's matches so many times throughout the tournament uh, f for nothing, you know, other than just the joy of bringing more content to the community. So everybody just give a big round of applause to them and their efforts throughout the tournament, helping get more content out there so that we can all, you know, join in and be more a part of this thing together rather than just playing our matches privately, you know, amongst each other. So. I just really, really want to say thanks to you guys for doing that. And uh, also, if you guys like what you saw with Vorpal Board here, they're an awesome uh, company there, run, ran by a couple of great guys, and they're super supportive of everything we're doing with Unmatched. So if you guys like Vorpal and you're interested in learning more or maybe getting it for yourself, uh, check out the link on our Twitch channel. Um, if you've been on the Twitch channel for a while watching the stream, you might have to refresh for it to show up. But it will be on there, and if you click that link, you can find out more info. And if you guys end up wanting to get a subscription or anything, we do get some credit for that. So if you use the link, you know, we'd appreciate the support. And I'm sure Vorpal would too. And uh, again, they're great guys, so happy to help them out in any way that we can. And um, yeah, again, just thank you to everybody. Thank you, John and Tristan, for joining me on commentary. It was a pleasure having you guys with me. And uh, any closing thoughts you want to say, Tristan, before we sign off here? Thank you for having me. These were fantastic games, and I'm I'm so grateful to be able to to be here to witness that. And I, I look forward uh, to I'm not going to be commentating later, but I look forward to watching the the other matches when I when I can. Uh, good luck to all the competitors, uh, to to Joshua once again for for the finals, and congrats. And uh, yeah, thank, thanks for having me here. It's it's always a blast to be able to to sit and, and talk unmatched. Definitely, and I'm, I'm glad you came back for the second one, because I know you did commentate back in the first one, so glad to see you keeping up with it, and hope to have you back again in the future, of course, as a player yep. and a commentator and a streamer and all the above, so <laughs> thanks yep. for being if, a part of it. If possible, I'll, I'll be back for as, as long as I'm able, so I mean, <laughs> we'll awesome. see what happens. Yeah, awesome. All right, John, how about you? Any closing final thoughts? Yeah, well, to reiterate Tristan thank you so much for having me I mean thanks to you Josh and Gary for putting us together uh, I mean what's better than this you know uh, John I met game Tristan I met you through this game last tournament when we played together now the three of us are sitting here we're watching games and we're talking about games for a community that we love you love to see it just <laughs> guys being it. dudes it's just great no I mean in all seriousness though thank you so much this is so cool uh, I've had a blast. I'm super excited to come back later to commentate your match. Um, and to that end, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to need it. Bet. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be good. Mm -hmm. It's a rematch for you, too. It is. Yeah. We had two rematches for the semifinals. We just saw Baked Goods versus Joshua. And I am facing Sojourn, who is the one who gave me my only loss in Swiss uh, after a really close match. So... It's anyone's game, and uh, I'm looking forward to the rematch for sure. Awesome. What narratives we have. Yeah. So great. It's fantastic. And like I said, for the finals, it's either going to be Battle of Singapore or Battle of the TOs. So either way you slice it, it's going to be a great time. So um, if that's all, you know, we'll close out the stream here. Uh, I am going to be playing, again, my match at 5 p.m. Central Time, guys. So we are going to have a bit of a break in between, but... Part of the reason for that is that my opponent Sojourn is in Singapore like Joshua. So it's the middle of the night for them right now. So I got to have him uh, at least rested up, you know, so he can play well and not give me a free win. So <laughs> we'll be back at 5 p.m. Central for the second semifinal. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And then again tomorrow morning, same time, uh, 9 a.m. Central time start for the grand finals. And uh, we'll find out who's going to be playing in the grand finals after my match later today. So. Be sure to come back at 5 p.m. Central so you can catch the other semifinal match. And thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll see you next time.